Section 50 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Observation 45. Of the Great Bellied Gnat or Female Gnat. The second gnat, delineated in the twenty-ninth scheme, is of a very differing shape from the former. But yet of this sort also I found several of the gnats that were generated out of the water insect. The wings of this were much larger than those of the other, and the belly much bigger, shorter and of an other shape, and from several particulars I guessed it to be the female gnat and the former to be the male the thorax of this was much like that of the other having a very strong and ridged back piece which went also on either side of its legs about the wings there were several jointed pieces of armor which seemed curiously and conveniently contrived for the promoting and strengthening the motion of the wings its head was much differing from the other being much bigger and neater shaped and the horns that grew out between his eyes on two little balls were of a very differing shape from the tufts of the other gnat these having but a few knots or joints and each of those but a few and those short and strong bristles the foremost horns or feelers were like those of the former gnat one of these gnats i have suffered to pierce the skin of my hand with its proboscis and thence to draw out as much blood as to fill its belly as full as it could hold making it appear very red and transparent and this without any further pain than whilst it was sinking in its proboscis as it is also in the stinging of fleas a good argument that these creatures do not wound the skin and suck the blood out of enmity and revenge but for mere necessity and to satisfy their hunger by what means this creature is able to suck we shall show in another place end of section fifty section fifty one of micrographia this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 51. Observation 46. Of the White Feather-Winged Moth, or Tinea Argentia. This white, long-winged moth which is delineated in the thirty scheme afforded a lovely object both to the naked eye and through a microscope to the eye it appeared a small milk-white fly with four white wings the two foremost somewhat longer than the two hindermost and the two shorter about half an inch long each of which four wings seemed to consist of two small long feathers very curiously tufted or haired on each side with purely white and exceedingly fine and small hairs proportioned to the stalks or stems out of which they grew much like the tufts of a long wing feather of some bird and their stalks or stems were like those bended backwards and downwards as may be plainly seen by the draughts of them in the figure observing one of these in my microscope i found in the first place that all the body legs horns and the stalks of the wings were covered over with various kinds of curious white feathers which did with handling or touching easily rub off and fly about insomuch that looking on my fingers with which i had handled this moth and perceiving on them little white specks i found by my microscope that they were several of the small feathers of this little creature that stuck up and down in the rugosities of my skin next i found that underneath these feathers the pretty insect was covered all over with a crusted shell like other of those animals but with one much thinner and tenderer thirdly i found as in birds also is notable 
it had differing and appropriate kinds of feathers that covered several parts of its body fourthly surveying the parts of its body with a more accurate and better magnifying microscope i found that the tufts or hairs of its wings were nothing else but a congeries or thick set cluster of small vimina or twigs resembling a small twig of birch stripped or whitened with which brushes are usually made to beat out or brush off the dust from cloth and hangings every one of the twigs or branches that composed the brush of the feathers appeared in this bigger magnifying glass of which e f represents one twenty-fourth part of an inch is the scale as g is of the lesser which is only one-third like the figure d the feathers also that covered a part of his body and were interspersed among the brush of his wings i found in the bigger magnifying glass of the shape a consisting of a stalk or stem in the middle and a seeming tuftedness or brushy part on each side the feathers that covered most part of his body and the stalk of his wings were in the same microscope much of the figure b appearing in the shape of a small feather and seemed tufted those which covered the horns and small parts of the legs through the same microscope appeared of the shape c whether the tufts of any or all of these small feathers consisted of such component particles as the feathers of birds i much doubt because i find that nature does not always keep or operate after the same method in smaller and bigger creatures and of this we have particular instances in the wings of several creatures for whereas in birds of all kinds it composes each of the feathers of which its wing consists of such an exceeding curious and most admirable and stupendous texture as i elsewhere show in the observations on a feather we find it to alter its method quite in the fabric of the wings of these minute creatures composing some of thin extended membranes or skins such as the wings of dragonflies in others those skins are all overgrown and pretty thick bestuck with short bristles as in flesh flies in others those films are covered both on the upper and under side with small feathers placed almost like the tiles on a house and are curiously ranged and adorned with most lively colors as is observable in butterflies and several kinds of moths in others instead of their films nature has provided nothing but a matter of half a score stalks if i well remember the number for i have not lately met with any of these flies and did not when i first observed them take sufficient notice of diverse particulars and each of these stalks with a few single branchings on each side resembling much the branched backbone of a herring or the like fish or a thin-haired peacock's feather the top or the eye being broken off with a few of these on either side which it was able to shut up or expand at pleasure much like a fan or rather like the posture of the feathers in a wing which lay all one under another when shut and by the side of each other when expanded this pretty little gray moth for such was the creature i observed thus winged could very nimbly and as it seemed very easily move its corpuscle through the air from place to place other insects have their wings cased or covered over with certain hollow shells shaped almost like those hollow trays in which butchers carry meat whose hollow sides being turned downwards do not only secure their folded wings from injury of the earth in which most of those creatures reside but whilst they fly serves as a help to sustain and bear them up and these are observable in scarabees and a multitude of other terrestrial crustaceous insects in which we may yet further observe a particular providence of nature now in all these kinds of wings we observe this particular as a thing most worthy remark that wherever a wing consists of discontinued parts the pores or interstitia between those parts are very seldom either much bigger 
or much smaller than these which we here find between the particles of these brushes so that it should seem to intimate that the parts of the air are such that they will not easily or readily if at all pass through these pores so that they seem to be strainers fine enough to hinder the particles of the air whether hindered by their bulk or by their agitation circulation rotation or undulation i shall not here determine from getting through them and by that means serve the animal as well if not better than if they were little films i say if not better because i have observed that all those creatures that have filmed wings move them aboundantly quicker and more strongly such as all kind of flies and scarabees and bats than such as have their wings covered with feathers as butterflies and birds or twigs as moths which have each of them a much slower motion of their wings that little ruggedness perhaps of their wings helping them somewhat by taking better hold of the parts of the air or not suffering them so easily to pass by any other way than one but whatever be the reason of it tis most evident that the smooth winged insects have the strongest muscles or movement parts of their wings and the other much weaker and this very insect we are now describing had a very small thorax or middle part of its body if compared to the length and number of its wings which therefore as he moved them very slowly so must he move them very weakly and this last property do we find somewhat observed also in bigger kind of flying creatures birds so that we see that the wisdom and providence of the all-wise creator is not less shown in these small despicable creatures flies and moths which we have branded with a name of ignominy calling them vermin than in those greater and more remarkable animate bodies birds i cannot here stand to add anything about the nature of flying though perhaps on another occasion i may say something on that subject it being such as may deserve a much more accurate examination and scrutiny than it has hitherto met with for to me there seems nothing wanting to make a man able to fly but what may be easily enough supplied from the mechanics hitherto known save only the want of strength which the muscles of a man seem utterly incapable of by reason of their smallness and texture but how even strength also may be mechanically made and an artificial muscle so contrived that thereby a man shall be able to exert what strength he pleases and to regulate it also to his own mind i may elsewhere endeavour to manifest End of section 51. Section 52 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 52 observation forty seven of the shepherd spider or long-legged spider the carter shepherd spider or long-legged spider has for two particularities very few similar creatures that i have met with the first which is discoverable only by the microscope and is in the first and second figures of the thirty-first scheme plainly described is the curious contrivance of his eyes of which differing from most other spiders he has only two and those placed upon the top of a small pillar or hillock rising out of the middle of the top of its back or rather the crown of its head for they were fixed on the very top of this pillar which is about the height of one of the transverse diameters of the eye and looked on in another posture appeared much of the shape b c d the two eyes b b were placed back to back with the transparent parts or the pupils looking towards either side but somewhat more forward than backwards c was the column or neck on which they stood and d the crown of the head out of which that neck sprung 
these eyes to appearance seem to be of the very same structure with that of larger binocular creatures seeming to have a very smooth and very protuberant cornea and in the midst of it to have a very black pupil encompassed about with a kind of grey iris as appears by the figure whether it were able to move these eyes to and fro i have not observed but tis not very likely he should the pillar or neck c seeming to be covered and stiffened with a crusty shell but nature in probability has supplied that defect by making the cornea so very protuberant and setting it so clear above the shadowing or obstructing of its prospect by the body that this likely each eye may perceive though not see distinctly almost a hemisphere whence having so small and round a body placed upon such long legs it is quickly able so to wind and turn it as to see anything distinct this creature as do all other spiders i have yet examined does very much differ from most other insects in the figure of its eyes for i cannot with my best microscope discover its eyes to be any ways knobbed or pearled like those of other insects the second peculiarity which is obvious to the eye is also very remarkable and that is the prodigious length of its legs in proportion to its small round body each leg of this i drew being above sixteen times the length of its whole body and there are some which have them yet longer and others that seem of the same kind that have them a great deal shorter the eight legs are each of them jointed just like those of a crab but every of the parts are spun out prodigiously longer in proportion each of these legs are terminated in a small case or shell shaped almost like that of a mussel shell as is evident in the third figure of the same scheme that represents the appearance of the under part or belly of the creature by the shape of the protuberant conical body i i i i etc these are as were placed or fastened on to the protuberant body of the insect which is to be supposed very high at m making a kind of blunt cone whereof m is to be supposed the apex about which greater cone of the body the smaller cones of the legs are placed each of them almost reaching to the top in so admirable a manner as does not a little manifest the wisdom of nature in the contrivance for these long levers as i may so call them of the legs having not the advantage of a long end on the other side of the hypomocleon or centres on which the parts of the legs move must necessarily require a vast strength to move them and keep the body balanced and suspended in so much that if we should suppose a man's body suspended by such a contrivance a hundred and fifty times the strength of a man would not keep the body from falling on the breast to supply therefore each of these legs with its proper strength nature has allowed to each a large chest or cell in which is included a very large and strong muscle and thereby this little animal is not only able to suspend its body upon less than these eight but to move it very swiftly over the tops of grass and leaves nor are these eight legs so prodigiously long but the ninth and tenth which are the two claws k k are as short and serve instead of a proboscis for those seem very little longer than his mouth each of them had three parts but very short the joints k k which represented the third being longer than both the other this creature seems which i have several times with pleasure observed to throw its body upon the prey instead of its hands not unlike a hunting spider which leaps like a cat at a mouse the whole fabric was a very pretty one and could i have dissected it i doubt not but i should have found as many singularities within it as without perhaps for the most part not unlike the parts of a crab which this little creature does in many things very much resemble the curiosity of whose contrivance i have in another place examined i omit the description of the horns a a of the mouth l l which seemed like that of a crab the speckledness of his shell which proceeded from a kind of feathers or hairs and the hairiness of his legs his large thorax and little belly and the like they being manifested by the figure and shall only take notice that the three parts of the body namely the head breast and belly are in this creature strangely confused so that tis difficult to determine which is which 
as they are also in a crab and indeed this seems to be nothing else but an air crab being made more light and nimble proportionable to the medium wherein it resides and as air seems to have but one thousandth part of the body of water so does this spider seem not to be a thousandth part of the bulk of a crab End of section 52. Section 53 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Observation 48 of the hunting spider and several other sorts of spiders. The hunting spider is a small gray spider prettily bespecked with black spots all over its body which the microscope discovers to be a kind of feathers like those on butterflies wings or the body of the white moth i lately described its gait is very nimble by fits sometimes running and sometimes leaping like a grasshopper almost then standing still and setting itself on its hinder legs it will very nimbly turn its body and look round itself every way it has six very conspicuous eyes, two looking directly forwards, placed just before, two other on either side of those, looking forward and sideways, and two other about the middle of the top of its back or head, which look backwards and sidewards. These seem to be the biggest. The surface of them all was very black, spherical, purely polished, reflecting a very clear and distinct image of all the ambient objects, such as a window a man's hand a white paper or the like some other properties of this spider observed by the most accomplished mr evelyn in his travels in italy are most emphatically set forth in the history hereunto annexed which he was pleased upon my desire to send me in writing of all the sorts of insects there is none has afforded me more divertisements than the venatores which are a sort of lupi that have their dens in the rugged walls and crevices of our houses a small brown and delicately spotted kind of spiders whose hinder legs are longer than the rest such i did frequently observe at rome which espying a fly at three or four yards distance upon the balcony where i stood would not make directly to her but crawl under the rail till being arrived to the antipodes it would steal up seldom missing its aim but if it chanced to want anything of being perfectly opposite would at first peep immediately slide down again till taking better notice it would come the next time exactly upon the fly's back but if this happened not to be within a competent leap then would this insect move so softly as the very shadow of the gnomon seemed not to be more imperceptible unless the fly moved and then would the spider move also in the same proportion keeping that just time with her motion as if the same soul had animated both those little bodies and whether it were forwards backwards or to either side without at all turning her body like a well-managed horse but if the capricious fly took wing and pitched upon another place behind our huntress then would the spider whirl its body so nimbly about as nothing could be imagined more swift by which means she always kept the head towards her prey though to appearance as immovable as if it had been a nail driven into the wood till by that indiscernible progress being arrived within the sphere of her reach she made a fatal leap swift as lightning upon the fly catching him in the pole where she never quitted hold till her belly was full and then carried the remainder home i have beheld them instructing their young ones how to hunt which they would sometimes discipline for not well observing but when any of the old ones did as sometimes miss a leap they would run out of the field and hide them in their crannies as ashamed and haply not be seen abroad for four or five hours after for so long have i watched the nature of this strange insect the contemplation of whose so wonderful sagacity and address has amazed me nor do i find in any chase whatsoever more cunning and stratagem observed i have found some of these spiders in my garden when the weather towards the spring is very hot but they are nothing so eager of hunting as they are in italy there are multitudes of other sorts of spiders 
whose eyes and most other parts and properties are so exceedingly different both from those i have described and from one another that it would be almost endless at least too long for my present essay to describe them as some with six eyes placed in quite another order others with eight eyes others with fewer and some with more they all seem to be creatures of prey and to feed on other small insects but their ways of catching them seem very differing the shepherd spider by running on his prey the hunting spider by leaping on it other sorts weave nets or cobwebs whereby they ensnare them nature having both fitted them with materials and tools and taught them how to work and weave their nets and to lie perdu and to watch diligently to run on any fly as soon as ever entangled their thread or web seems to be spun out of some viscous kind of excrement lying in their belly which though soft when drawn out is presently by reason of its smallness hardened and dried by the ambient air examining several of which with my microscope i found them to appear much like white horsehair or some such transparent horny substance and to be of very differing magnitudes some appearing as big as a pig's bristle others equal to a horsehair other no bigger than a man's hair others yet smaller and finer i observed further that the radiating cords of the web were much bigger and smoother than those that were woven round which seemed smaller and all over knotted or pearled with small transparent globules not unlike small crystal beads or seed pearls thin strung on a clue of silk which whether they were so spun by the spider or by the adventitious moisture of a fog which i have observed to cover all these filaments with such crystalline beads i will not now dispute these threads were some of them so small that i could very plainly with the microscope discover the same consecutions of colours as in a prism and they seem to proceed from the same cause with those colours which i have already described in thin plated bodies much resembling a cobweb or a confused lock of these cylinders is a certain white substance which after a fog may be observed to fly up and down the air catching several of these and examining them with my microscope i found them to be much of the same form looking most like to a flake of worsted prepared to be spun though by what means they should be generated or produced is not easily imagined they were of the same weight or very little heavier than the air and tis not unlikely but that those great white clouds that appear all the summer time may be of the same substance end of section fifty three Section 54 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 54. Observation 49 of an Ant or Pissmire. This was a creature more troublesome to be drawn than any of the rest, for I could not, for a good while, think of a way to make it suffer its body to lie quiet in a natural posture. But whilst it was alive, if its feet were fettered in wax or glue, it would so twist and wind its body that I could not any ways get a good view of it, and if I killed it, its body was so little that I did often spoil the shape of it before I could thoroughly view it. For this is the nature of these minute bodies— that as soon almost as ever their life is destroyed, their parts immediately shrivel and lose their beauty. And so is it also with small plants, as I instanced before in the description of moss. And thence also is the reason of the variations in the beards of wild oats, and in those of muskgrass seed, that their bodies, being exceeding small, those small variations which are made in the surfaces of all bodies, almost upon every change of air, especially if the body be porous, do here become sensible, where the whole body is so small that it is almost nothing but surface. For as in vegetable substances, I see no great reason to think that the moisture of the air, that sticking to a wreathed beard, does make it untwist, should evaporate or exhale away any faster than the moisture of other bodies, but rather that the avalation from, or access of moisture to, the surfaces of bodies being much the same, 
those bodies become most sensible of it, which have the least proportion of body to their surface. So is it also with animal substances. The dead body of an ant, or such little creature, does almost instantly shrivel and dry, and your object shall be quite another thing before you can half delineate it, which proceeds not from the extraordinary exhalation, but from the small proportion of body and juices, to the usual drying of bodies in the air, especially if warm. For which inconvenience, where I could not otherwise remove it, I thought of this expedient. I took the creature I had designed to delineate, and put it into a drop of very well rectified spirit of wine. This I found would presently dispatch, as it were, the animal, and being taken out of it and laid on a paper, the spirit of wine would immediately fly away and leave the animal dry in its natural posture, or at least in a constitution that it might easily with a pin be placed in what posture you desired to draw it, and the limbs would so remain without either moving or shriveling. And thus I dealt with this ant, which I have here delineated, which was one of many of a very large kind that inhabited under the roots of a tree, from whence they would sally out in great parties and make most grievous havoc of the flowers and fruits in the ambient garden, and return back again very expertly by the same ways and paths they went. It was more than half the bigness of an earwig, of a dark brown or reddish color, with long legs, on the hinder of which it would stand up and raise its head as high as it could above the ground, that it might stare the further about it, just after the same manner as I have also observed a hunting spider to do. And putting my finger towards them, they have at first all run towards it, till almost at it, and then they would stand around about it, at a certain distance, and smell, as it were, and consider whether they should any of them venture any further, till one more bold than the rest venturing to climb it, all the rest, if I would have suffered them, would have immediately followed." Many such other seemingly rational actions I have observed in this little vermin with much pleasure, which would be too long to be here related. Those that desire more of them may satisfy their curiosity in Ligon's History of the Barbados. Having ensnared several of these into a small box, I made choice of the tallest grown among them, and separating it from the rest, I gave it a gill of brandy, or spirit of wine, which after a while Ian knocked him down dead drunk, so that he became moveless, though at first putting in he struggled for a pretty while very much, till at last, certain bubbles issuing out of its mouth, it ceased to move. This, because I had before found them quickly to recover again, if they were taken out presently, I suffered to lie above an hour in the spirit, and after I had taken it out and put its body and legs into a natural posture, remained moveless about an hour." But then, upon a sudden, as if it had awakened out of a drunken sleep, it suddenly revived and ran away. Being caught, and served as before, he for a while continued struggling and striving, till at last there issued several bubbles out of its mouth, and then, tan quam anamam expiraset, he remained moveless for a good while, but at length again recovering, it was again redipped and suffered to lie some hours in the spirit notwithstanding which, after it had lain dry some three or four hours, it again recovered life and motion. Which kind of experiments, if prosecuted, which they highly deserve, seem to me of no inconsiderable use towards the invention of the latent scheme, as the noble virulum calls it, or the hidden, unknown texture of bodies. Of what figure this creature appeared through the microscope, the thirty-two scheme, though not so carefully graven as it ought, will represent to the eye, namely, that it had a large head, A.A., at the upper end of which were two protuberant eyes, pearled like those of a fly, but smaller, B.B., out of the nose, or foremost part, issued two horns, C.C., of a shape sufficiently differing from those of a blue fly, though indeed they seemed to be both the same kind of organ, and to serve for a kind of smelling, Beyond these were two indented jaws, D.D., which he opened sideways, and was able to gape them asunder very wide, and the ends of them being armed with teeth, which meeting went between each other, it was able to grasp and hold a heavy body, three or four times the bulk and weight of its own body. 
It had only six legs, shaped like those of a fly, which, as I showed before, is an argument that it is a winged insect, and though I could not perceive any sign of them in the middle part of its body, which seemed to consist of three joints or pieces EFG out of which sprung two legs, yet tis known that there are of them that have long wings and fly up and down in the air. The third and last part of its body, III, was bigger and larger than the other two, unto which it was joined by a very small middle and had a kind of loose shell or another distinct part of its body, H, which seemed to be interposed and to keep the thorax and belly from touching. The whole body was cased over with a very strong armor, and the belly, III, was covered likewise with multitudes of small white shining bristles, the legs, horns, head, and middle parts of its body were bestuck with hairs also, but smaller and darker. End of section 54 Section 55 of Micrographia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micrographia by Robert Hooke Observation 50 Of the Wandering Mite In September and October 1661, I observed in Oxford several of these little pretty creatures to wander to and fro, and often to travel over the plains of my window. And in September and October 1663, I observed likewise several of these very same creatures traversing a window at London, and looking without the window upon the subjacent wall, I found whole flocks of the same kind running to and fro among the small groves and thickets of green moss, and upon the curiously spreading vegetable blue or yellow moss, which is a kind of a mushroom or jew's ear. These creatures to the naked eye seem to be a kind of black mite, but much nimbler and stronger than the ordinary cheese mites, but examining them in a microscope I found them to be a very fine crusted or shelled insect, much like that represented in the first figure of the three-and-thirtieth scheme, with a protuberant oval shell A, indented or pitted with an abundance of small pits, all covered over with little white bristles, whose points all directed backwards. It had eight legs, each of them provided with a very sharp talon, or claw at the end, which this little animal in its going fastened into the pores of the body over which it went. Each of these legs were bestuck in every joint of them with multitudes of small hairs, or if we respect the proportion they bore to the bigness of the leg, turnpikes, all pointing towards the claws. The thorax or middle parts of the body of this creature was exceedingly small in respect both of the head and belly, it being nothing but that part which was covered by the two shells BB, though it seemed to grow thicker underneath. And indeed, if we consider the great variety nature uses in proportioning the three parts of the body, the head, thorax, and belly, we shall not wonder at the small proportion of this thorax, nor at the vaster bulk of the belly. For could we exactly anatomize this little creature and observe the particular designs of each part, we should doubtless, as we do in all her more manageable and tractable fabrics, find much more reason to admire the excellency of her contrivance and workmanship than to wonder it was not made otherwise. The head of this little insect was shaped somewhat like a mite's, that is, it had a long snout, in the manner of a hog's, with a knobbed ridge running along the middle of it, which was bestuck on either side with many small bristles all pointing forward, and two very large pikes or horns which rose from the top of the head just over each eye, and pointed forward also. It had two pretty large black eyes on either side of the head EE, -E, from one of which I could see a very bright reflection of the window, which made me guess that the cornea of it was smooth like those of bigger insects. Its motion was pretty quick and strong, it being able very easily to tumble a stone or clod four times as big as its whole body. At the same time and place and divers times since, I have observed with my microscope another little insect which, though I have not annexed the picture of, may be worth noting for its exceeding nimbleness as well as smallness. It was as small as a mite with a body deep and ridged, almost like a flea. It had eight blood-red legs, not very long but slender, and two horns or feelers before. Its motion was so exceeding quick that I have often lost sight of one I have observed with my naked eye 
and though when it was not frightened I was able to follow the motions of some with my microscope, yet if it were never so little startled, it posted away with such speed and turned and winded itself so quick that I should presently lose sight of it. When I first observed the form of these insects or mites, I began to conjecture that certainly I had found out the vagabond parents of those mites we find in cheeses, meal, corn, seeds, musty barrels, musty leather, etc., these little creatures wandering to and fro every whither might perhaps, as they were invited hither and thither by the musty steams of several putrefying bodies, make their invasions upon those new and pleasing territories, and there spending the remainder of their life, which might be perhaps a day or thereabouts, in very plentiful and riotous living, might leave their offspring behind them, which by the change of the soil and country they now inhabit, might be quite altered from the hue of their primogenitors and like mores translated into northern european climates after a little time change both their skin and shape and this seems yet more probable in these insects because that the soil or body they inhabit seems to be almost half their parent for it not only hatches and brings those little eggs or seminal principles to perfection but seems to augment and nourish them also before they are hatched or shaped for it is obvious enough to be observed that the eggs of many other insects, and particularly of mites, are increased in bulk after they are laid out of the bodies of the insects, and plump sometimes into many times their former bigness, so that the bodies that are laid in being, as it were, half their mothers, we shall not wonder that it should have such an active power to change their forms. We find by relations how much the negro women do besmear the offspring of the Spaniard, bringing forth neither white skin nor black, but tawny hided mulattoes. Now, though I propound this as probable, I have not yet been so far certified by observations as to conclude anything either positively or negatively concerning it. Perhaps some more lucky diligence may please the curious inquirer with the discovery of this to be a truth which I now conjecture and may thereby give him a satisfactory account of the cause of those creatures whose original seems yet to obscure, and may give him cause to believe, that many other animate beings that seem also to be the mere product of putrefaction, may be ennobled with a pedigree as ancient as the first creation, and far exceed the greatest beings in their numerous genealogies. But on the other side, if it should be found that these or any other animate body have no immediate similar parent, I have in another place set down a conjectural hypothesis, whereby those phenomena may likely enough be solved, wherein the infinite wisdom and providence of the Creator is no less rare and wonderful. End of section 55. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 56 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micrographia by Robert Hooke Section 56 Of the Crab-like Insect Reading one day in September, I chanced to observe a very small creature creep over the book I was reading very slowly. Having a microscope by me, I observed it to be a creature of a very unusual form, and that not less notable, such as is described in the second figure of the thirty-third scheme. It was about the bigness of a large mite, or somewhat longer. It had ten legs, eight of which, A-A-A-A, -A -A -A, were topped with very sharp claws, and were those upon which he walked, seeming shaped much like those of a crab, which in many other things also this little creature resembled. For the two other claws, B-B, -B, which were the foremost of all the ten, and seemed to grow out of his head like the horns of other animals, were exactly formed in the manner of crabs or lobsters' claws. For they were shaped and jointed much like those represented in the scheme, and the ends of them were furnished with a pair of claws, or pincers, cc, which this little animal did open and shut at pleasure. It seemed to make use of those two horns, or claws, both for feelers and holders, for in its motion it carried these aloft extended before, moving them to and fro, just as a man blindfolded would do his hands when he is fearful of running against a wall. And if I put a hair to it, it would readily take hold of it with these claws, and seem to hold it fast. 
Now, though these horns seemed to serve him for two uses, namely for feeling and holding, yet he seemed neither blind, having two small black spots, D.D., which by the make of them and the bright reflection from them seemed to be his eyes, nor did it want other hands, having another pair of claws, E.E., -E, very near place to its mouth and seemed adjoining to it. The whole body was cased over with armor shells, as is usual in all these kinds of crustaceous creatures, especially about their bellies, and seemed of three kinds. The head, F, seemed covered with a kind of scaly shell, the thorax with two smooth shells, or rings, G, G, and the belly with eight knobbed ones. I could not certainly find whether it had under these last shells any wings, but I suspect the contrary for I have not found any winged insect with eight legs, two of those legs being always converted into wings, and for the most part, those that have but six, have wings. This creature, though I could not meet with more than one of them, and so could not make so many examinations of it as otherwise I would, I did, notwithstanding, by reason of the great curiosity that appeared to me in its shape, delineate it, to show that in all likelihood nature had crowded together into this very minute insect as many and as excellent contrivances as into the body of a very large crab, which exceeds it in bulk, perhaps some millions of times. For as to all the apparent parts there is a greater rather than a less multiplicity of parts. Each leg has as many parts and as many joints as a crab's, nay, and as many hairs or bristles and the like may be in all the other visible parts, and tis very likely that the internal curiosities are not less excellent, it being a general rule in nature's proceedings that where she begins to display any excellency, if the subject be further searched into, it will manifest that there is not less curiosity in those parts which our single eye cannot reach, than in those which are more obvious. End of section 56. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 57 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vissal. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 57. Observation 52. Of the small silver-colored bookworm. As among greater animals, there are many that are scaled both for ornament and defence, so are there not wanting such also among the lesser bodies of insects, whereof this little creature gives us an instance. It is a small white silver shining worm or moth, which I found much conversant among books and papers, and is supposed to be that which corrodes and eats holes through the leaves and covers. It appears to the naked eye a small glittering pearl-coloured moth, which upon the removing of books and papers in the summer is often observed very nimbly to scud and pack away to some lurking cranny where it may the better protect itself from any appearing dangers. Its head appears big and blunt and its body tapers from it towards the tail, smaller and smaller being shaped almost like a carrot. This, the microscopical appearance, will more plainly manifest which exhibits in the third figure of the 33 scheme a conical body divided into 14 several partitions being the appearance of so many several shells or shields that cover the whole body every of these shells are again covered or tiled over with a multitude of thin transparent scales which from the multiplicity of their reflecting surfaces make the whole animal appear of a perfect pearl color which, by the way, may hint us the reason of that so much admired appearance of those so highly esteemed bodies, as also of the like in mother-of-pearl shells, and in multitudes of other shelly sea substances, for they each of them consisting of an infinite number of very thin shells or laminated orbiculations, cause such multitudes of reflections, that the compositions of them together with the reflections of others that are so thin as to afford colours, of which I elsewhere give the reason, gives a very pleasant reflection of light, 
and that this is the true cause seems likely first because all those so appearing bodies are compounded of multitudes of plated substances and next that by ordering any transparent substance after this manner the like phenomena may be produced this will be made very obvious by the blowing of glass into exceeding thin shells and then breaking them into scales which any lamp worker will presently do for a good quantity of these scales laid in a heap together have much the same resemblance of pearls another way not less instructive and pleasant is a way which i have several times done which is by working and tossing as it were a parcel of pure crystalline glass whilst it is kept glowing hot in the blown flame of a lamp for by that means that purely transparent body will be so divided into an infinite number of plates or small strings with interposed aerial plates and fibres that from the multiplicity of the reflections from each of those internal surfaces it may be drawn out into curious pearl-like or silver wire which though small will yet be opacous the same thing i have done with a composition of red colophon and turpentine and a little beeswax and may be done likewise with bird lime and such like glutinous and transparent bodies but to return to our description the small blunt head of this insect was furnished on either side of it with a cluster of eyes each of which seemed to contain but a very few in comparison of what i had observed the clusters of other insects to abound with each of these clusters were beset with a row of small bristles much like the cilia or hairs on the eyelids and perhaps they served for the same purpose it had two long horns before which were straight and tapering towards the top curiously ringed or knobbed and bristled much like the marshweed called horsetail or cat's tail having at each knot a fringed girdle as i may so call it of smaller hairs and several bigger and larger bristles here and there dispersed among them besides these it had two shorter horns or feelers which were knotted and fringed just as the former but wanted bristles and were blunt at the ends the hinder part of the creature was terminated with three tails in every particular resembling the two longer horns that grew out of the head the legs of it were scaled and haired much like the rest but are not expressed in this figure the moth being entangled all in glue and so the legs of this appeared not through the glass which looked perpendicularly upon the back this animal probably feeds upon the paper and covers of books and perforates in them several small round holes finding perhaps a convenient nourishment in those hulks of hemp and flax which have passed through so many scourings washings dressings and dryings as the parts of old paper must necessarily have suffered the digestive faculty it seems of these little creatures being able yet further to work upon those stubborn parts and reduce them into another form and indeed when i consider what a heap of sawdust or chips this little creature which is one of the teeth of time conveys into its intrals i cannot choose but remember and admire the excellent contrivance of nature in placing in animals such a fire as is continually nourished and supplied by the materials conveyed into the stomach and fomented by the bellows of the lungs and in so contriving the most admirable fabric of animals as to make the very spending and wasting of that fire to be instrumental to the procuring and collecting more materials to augment and cherish itself which indeed seems to be the principal end of all contrivances observable in brute animals end of section fifty seven section fifty eight of micrographia this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 58. Observation 53. Of a flea. The strength and beauty of this small creature, had it no other relation at all to man, would deserve a description. For its strength, the microscope is able to make no greater discoveries of it than the naked eye, but only the curious contrivance of its legs and joints. For the exerting that strength is very plainly manifested, such as no other creature I have yet observed has anything like it. For the joints of it are so adapted that he can, as twere, fold them short one within another, 
and suddenly stretch or spring them out to their whole length that is of the forelegs the part a of the thirty-four scheme lies within b and b within c parallel to or side by side each other but the parts of the two next lie quite contrary that is d without e and e without f but parallel also but the parts of the hinder legs g h and i bend one within another like the parts of a double-jointed ruler or like the foot leg and thigh of a man these six legs he clitches up altogether and when he leaps springs them all out and thereby exerts his whole strength at once but as for the beauty of it the microscope manifests it to be all over adorned with a curiously polished suit of sable armor neatly jointed and beset with multitudes of sharp pins shaped almost like porcupine's quills or bright conical steel bodkins the head is on either side beautified with a quick and round black eye k behind each of which also appears a small cavity l in which he seems to move to and fro a certain thin film beset with many small transparent hairs which probably may be his ears in the forepart of his head between the two forelegs he has two small long-jointed feelers or rather smellers m m which have four joints and are hairy like those of several other creatures between these it has a small proboscis or probe n n o that seems to consist of a tube n n and a tongue or sucker o which i have perceived him to slip in and out besides these it also has two chaps or biters p p which are somewhat like those of an ant but i could not perceive them toothed these were shaped very like the blades of a pair of round top scissors and were opened and shut just after the same manner with these instruments does this little busy creature bite and pierce the skin and suck out the blood of an animal leaving the skin inflamed with a small round red spot these parts are very difficult to be discovered because for the most part they lie covered between the forelegs there are many other particulars which being more obvious and affording no great matter of information i shall pass by and refer the reader to the figure End of section fifty eight section fifty nine of micrographia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah micrographia by robert hook section fifty nine observation fifty four of a louse this is a creature so officious that twill be known to every one at one time or other so busy and so impudent that it will be intruding itself in every one's company and so proud and aspiring withal that it fears not to trample on the best and affects nothing so much as a crown feeds and lives very high and that makes it so saucy as to pull any one by the ears that comes in its way and will never be quiet till it has drawn blood it is troubled at nothing so much as at a man that scratches his head as knowing that man is plotting and contriving some mischief against it and that makes it oftentimes skulk into some meaner and lower place and run behind a man's back though it go very much against the hair which ill conditions of it having made it better known than trusted would exempt me from making any further description of it did not my faithful mercury my microscope 
bring me other information of it for this has discovered to me by means of a very bright light cast on it that it is a creature of very odd shape it has a head shaped like that expressed in thirty five scheme marked with a which seems almost conical but is a little flatted on the upper and under sides at the biggest part of which on either side behind the head as it were being the place where other creatures ears stand are placed its two black shining goggle eyes b b looking backwards and fenced round with several small cilia or hairs that encompass it so that it seems like this creature has no very good foresight it does not seem to have any eyelids and therefore perhaps its eyes were so placed that it might the better cleanse them with its forelegs and perhaps this may be the reason why they so much avoid and run from the light behind them for being made to live in the shady and dark recesses of the hair and thence probably their eye having a great aperture the open and clear light especially that of the sun must needs very much offend them to secure these eyes from receiving any injury from the hairs through which it passes it has two horns that grow before it in the place where one would have thought the eyes should be each of these c c hath four joints which are fringed as twere with small bristles from which to the tip of its snout d the head seems very round and tapering ending in a very sharp nose d which seems to have a small hole and to be the passage through which he sucks the blood now whereas if it be placed on its back with its belly upwards as it is in the thirty-five scheme it seems in several positions to have a resemblance of chaps or jaws as is represented in the figure by e e yet in other postures those dark strokes disappear and having kept several of them in a box for two or three days so that for all that time they had nothing to feed on i found upon letting one creep on my hand that it immediately fell to sucking and did neither seem to thrust its nose very deep into the skin nor to open any kind of mouth but i could plainly perceive a small current of blood which came directly from its snout and passed into its belly and about a there seemed a contrivance somewhat resembling a pump pair of bellows or heart for by a very swift systole and diastole the blood seemed drawn from the nose and forced into the body it did not seem at all though i viewed it a good while as it was sucking to thrust more of its nose into the skin than the very snout d nor did it cause the least discernible pain and yet the blood seemed to run through its head very quick and freely so that it seems there is no part of the skin but the blood is dispersed into nay even into the cuticula for had it thrust its whole nose in from d to c c it would not have amounted to the proposed thickness of that tegument the length of the nose being not more than a three hundredth part of an inch it has six legs covered with a very transparent shell and jointed exactly like a crab's or lobster's each leg is divided into six parts by these joints and those have here and there several small hairs and at the end of each leg it has two claws very properly adapted for its peculiar use being thereby enabled to walk very securely both on the skin and hair and indeed this contrivance of the feet is very curious and could not be made more commodiously and compendiously for performing both these requisite motions of walking and climbing up the hair of a man's head than it is for by having the lesser claw a set so much shorter of the bigger b when it walks on the skin 
the shorter touches not and then the feet are the same with those of a mite and several other small insects but by means of the small joints of the longer claw it can bend it round and so with both claws take hold of a hair in the manner represented in the figure the long transparent cylinder f f f being a man's hair held by it the thorax seemed cased with another kind of substance than the belly namely with a thin transparent horny substance which upon the fasting of the creature did not grow flaccid through this i could plainly see the blood sucked from my hand to be variously distributed and moved to and fro and about g there seemed a pretty big white substance which seemed to be moved within its thorax besides there appeared very many small milk-white vessels which crossed over the breast between the legs out of which on either side were many small branchings these seemed to be the veins and arteries for that which is analogous to blood in all insects is milk white the belly is covered with a transparent substance likewise but more resembling a skin than a shell for tis grained all over the belly just like the skin in the palms of a man's hand and when the belly is empty grows very flaccid and wrinkled at the upper end of this is placed the stomach h h and perhaps also the white spot i i may be the liver or pancreas which by the peristaltic motion of the guts is a little moved to and fro not with a systole and diastole but rather with a thronging or jostling motion viewing one of these creatures after it had fasted two days all the hinder part was lank and flaccid and the white spot i i hardly moved most of the white branchings disappeared and most also of the redness or sucked blood in the guts the peristaltic motion of which was scarce discernible but upon the suffering it to suck it presently filled the skin of the belly and of the six scalloped embossments on either side as full as it could be stuffed the stomach and guts were as full as they could hold the peristaltic motion of the gut grew quick and the jostling motion of i i accordingly multitudes of milk-white vessels seemed quickly filled and turgid which were perhaps the veins and arteries and the creature was so greedy that though it could not contain more yet it continued sucking as fast as ever and as fast emptying itself behind the digestion of this creature must needs be very quick for though i perceived the blood thicker and blacker when sucked yet when in the guts it was of a very lovely ruby colour and that part of it which was digested into the veins seemed white whence it appears that a further digestion of blood may make it milk at least of a resembling colour what is else observed in the figure of this creature may be seen by the thirty-five scheme End of section 59section 60 of micrographia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion Gines, salt lake city utah micrographia by robert hook section 60 observation 55 of mites the least of reptiles i have hitherto met with is a mite a creature whereof there are some so very small that the sharpest sight unassisted with glasses is not able to discern them though being white of themselves they move on a black and smooth surface and the eggs out of which these creatures seem to be hatched are yet smaller those being usually not above a four or five hundredth part of a well-grown mite and those well-grown mites not much above one hundredth of an inch in thickness so that according to this reckoning 
there may be no less than a million of well-grown mites contained in a cubic inch, and five hundred times as many eggs. Notwithstanding which minuteness a good microscope discovers those small movable specks to be very pretty shaped insects, each of them furnished with eight well-shaped and proportioned legs, which are each of them jointed or bendable in eight several places, or joints, each of which is covered for the most part with a very transparent shell and the lower end of the shell of each joint is fringed with several small hairs. The contrivance of the joints seems the very same with that of crabs and lobster legs, and like those also, they are each of them terminated with a very sharp claw or point. Four of these legs are so placed that they seem to draw forwards. The other four are placed in a quite contrary position, thereby to keep the body backwards when there is occasion. The body, as in other larger insects, consists of three regions or parts. The hinder or belly A seems covered with one entire shell. The middle or chest seems divided into two shells B, C, which, running one within the other, the mite is able to shrink in and thrust out as it finds occasion as it can also the snout d the whole body is pretty transparent so that being looked on against the light diverse motions within its body may be perceived as also all the parts are much more plainly delineable than in other postures to the light the shell especially that which covers the back is curiously polished so that tis easy to see as in a convex looking-glass or foliated glass ball the picture of all the objects round about up and down in several parts of its body it has several small long white hairs growing out of its shell which are often longer than the whole body and are represented too short in the first and second figures they seem all pretty straight and pliable save only two upon the forepart of its body which seem to be the horns as may be seen in the figures the first whereof is a prospect of a smaller sort of mites which are usually more plump as it was passant to and fro the second is the prospect of one fixed on its tail by means of a little mouth glue rubbed on the object plate exhibiting the manner of the growing of the legs together with their several joints this creature is very much diversified in shape color and diverse other properties according to the nature of the substance out of which it seems to be engendered and nourished being in one substance more long in another more round in some more hairy in others more smooth in this nimble in that slow here pale and whiter there browner blacker more transparent etc i have observed it to be resident almost on all kinds of substances that are mouldy or putrefying and have seen it very nimbly meshing through the thickets of mould and sometimes to lie dormant underneath them and tis not unlikely but that it may feed on that vegetating substance spontaneous vegetables seeming a food proper enough for spontaneous animals but whether indeed this creature or any other be such or not i cannot positively from any experiment or observation i have yet made determine but as i formerly hinted it seems probable that some kind of wandering might may sow as twere the first seeds or lay the first eggs in those places which nature has instructed them to know convenient for the hatching and nourishing their young and though perhaps the prime parent might be of a shape very differing from what the offspring after a little while by reason of the substance they feed on 
or the region as twere they inhabit yet perhaps even one of these altered progeny wandering again from its native soil and lighting on by chance the same place from whence its prime parent came and there settling and planting may produce a generation of mites of the same shapes and properties with the first wandering mite and from some such accidents as these i am very apt to think the most sorts of animals generally accounted spontaneous have their origination and all those various sorts of might that are to be met with up and down in diverse putrefying substances may perhaps be all of the same kind and have sprung from one and the same sort of mites at the first End of section 60. Section 61 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 61 observation fifty six of a small creature hatched on a vine there is almost all the spring and summer time a certain small round white cobweb as twere about the bigness of a pea which sticks very close and fast to the stalks of vines nailed against a warm wall being attentively viewed they seem covered upon the upper side of them with a small husk not unlike the scale or shell of a woodlouse or hoglouse a small insect usually found about rotten wood which upon touching presently rolls itself into a form of a peppercorn separating several of these from the stalk i found them with my microscope to consist of a shell which now seemed more likely to be the husk of one of these insects and the fur seemed a kind of cobweb consisting of abundance of small filaments or sleeves of cobwebs in the midst of this if they were not hatched and run away before the time of which hatching was usually about the latter end of june or beginning of july i have often found abundance of small brown eggs such as a and b in the second figure of the thirty-six scheme much about the bigness of mites eggs and at other times multitudes of small insects shaped exactly like that in the third figure marked with ten its head large almost half the bigness of its body which is usual in the fetus of most creatures it had two small black eyes a a and two small long jointed and bristled horns b b the hinder part of its body seemed to consist of nine scales and the last ended in a forked tail much like that of a cuteo or woodlouse out of which grew two long hairs they ran to and fro very swiftly and were much of the bigness of a common mite but some of them less the longest of them seemed not the hundredth part of an inch and the eggs usually not above half as much they seemed to have six legs which were not visible in this i have here delineated by reason they were drawn under its body if these minute creatures were wood-lice as indeed from their own shape and from the frame the skin or shell that grows on them one may with great probability guess it affords us an instance whereof perhaps there are not many like in nature and that is of the prodigious increase of these creatures after they are hatched and run about for a common woodlouse of about half an inch long is no less than a hundred and twenty-five thousand times bigger than one of these which though indeed it seems very strange yet i have observed the young ones of some spiders have almost kept the same proportion to their dame this methinks if it be so does in the next place hint a query which may perhaps deserve a little further examination 
and that is whether there be not many of those minute creatures such as mites and the like which though they are commonly thought of otherwise are only the pulley or young ones of much bigger insects and not the generating or parent insect that has laid those eggs for having many times observed those eggs which usually are found in great abundance where mites are found it seems something strange that so small an animal should have an egg so big in proportion to its body though on the other side i must confess that having kept diverse of those mites enclosed in a box for a good while i did not find them very much augmented beyond their usual bigness what the husk and cobweb of this little white substance should be i cannot imagine unless it be that the old one when impregnated with eggs should there stay and fix itself on the vine and die and all the body by degrees should rot save only the husk and the eggs in the body and the heat or fire as it were of the approaching sunbeams should vivify those relics of the corrupted parent and out of the ashes as twere as it is fabled of the phoenix should raise a new offspring for the perpetuation of the species nor will the cobweb as it were in which these eggs are enclosed make much against this conjecture for we may by those cobwebs that are carried up and down the air after a fog which with my microscope i have discovered to be made up of an infinite company of small filaments or threads learn that such a texture of body may be otherwise made than by the spinning of a worm end of section sixty one Section 62 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Micrographia by Robert Hook. Observation 57 of the Eels in Vinegar of these small eels which are to be found in diverse sorts of vinegar i have little to add besides their picture which you may find drawn in the third figure of the twenty-five scheme that is they were shaped much like an eel save only that their nose a which was a little more opacious than the rest of their body was a little sharper and longer in proportion to their body and the wriggling motion of their body seemed to be only upwards and downwards whereas that of eels is only sideways they seemed to have a more opacious part about b which might perhaps be their gills it seeming always the same proportionate distant from their nose from which to the tip of their tail c their body seemed to taper taking several of these out of their pond of vinegar by the net of a small piece of filtering paper and laying them on a black smooth glass plate i found that they could wriggle and wind their body as much almost as a snake which made me doubt whether they were a kind of eel or leech i shall add no other observations made on this minute animal being prevented herein by many excellent ones already published by the ingenious dr power among his microscopical observations save only that a quantity of vinegar replete with them being included in a small vial and stopped very close from the ambient air all the included worms in a very short time died as if they had been stifled and that their motion seems contrary to what we may observe in the motion of all other insects exceedingly slow but the reason of it seems plain for being to move to and fro after that manner which they do by waving only or wriggling their body the tenacity or glutinousness and the density or resistance of the fluid medium become so exceeding sensible to their extremely minute bodies 
that it is to me indeed a greater wonder that they move them so fast as they do than that they move them no faster for what a vastly greater proportion have they of their superficies to their bulk than eels or other larger fishes and next the tenacity and density of the liquor being much the same to be moved both by the one and the other the resistance or impediment thence arising to the motions made through it must be almost infinitely greater to the small one than to the great this we find experimentally verified in the air which though a medium a thousand times more rarefied than the water the resistance of it to motions made through it is yet so sensible to very minute bodies that a down feather the least of whose parts seem yet bigger than these eels and many of them almost incomparably bigger such as the quill and stalk is suspended by it and carried to and fro as if it had no weight end of section sixty two section sixty three of micrographia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org micrographia by robert hook observation fifty eight part one of a new property in the air and several other transparent mediums named inflection whereby very many considerable phenomena are attempted to be solved and divers other uses are hinted since the invention and perfecting in some measure of telescopes it has been observed by several that the sun and moon near the horizon are disfigured losing that exactly smooth terminating circular limb which they are observed to have when situated nearer the zenith and are bounded with an edge every way especially upon the right and left sides ragged and indented like a saw which inequality of their limbs i have further observed not to remain always the same but to be continually changed by a kind of fluctuating motion not unlike that of the waves of the sea so as that part of the limb which was but even now nicked or indented in is now protuberant and will presently be sinking again neither is this all but the whole bodies of the luminaries do in the telescope seem to be depressed and slatted the upper and more especially the under side appearing nearer to the middle than really they are and the right and left appearing more remote whence the whole area seems to be terminated by a kind of oval it is further observed that the body for the most part appears red or of some colour approaching near unto it is some kind of yellow and this i have always marked that the more the limb is slatted or ovaled the more red does the body appear though not always the contrary it is further observable that both fixed stars and planets the nearer they appear to the horizon the more red and dull they look and the more they are observed to twinkle insomuch that i have seen the dog star to vibrate so strongly in bright irradiation of light as almost to dazzle my eyes and presently almost to disappear it is also observable that those bright scintillations near the horizon are not by much so quick and sudden in their consecutions of one another as the nimblest twinklings of stars nearer the zenith this is also notable that the stars near the horizon are twinkled with several colors so as sometimes to appear red sometimes more yellow and sometimes blue and this when the star is a pretty way elevated above the horizon i have further very often seen some of the small stars of the fifth or sixth magnitude at certain times to disappear for a small moment of time and again appear more conspicuous and with a greater luster i have several times with my naked eye seen many smaller stars such as may be called of the seventh or eighth magnitude to appear for a short space and then vanish which by directing a small telescope towards that part they appeared and disappeared in I could presently find to be indeed small stars so situate as I had seen them with my naked eye and to appear twinkling like the ordinary visible stars. Nay, in examining some very notable parts of the heaven with a three-foot tube, methought I now and then in several parts of the constellation could perceive little twinklings of stars making a very short kind of apparition and presently vanishing 
but noting diligently the places where they thus seemed to play at Bo Peep, I made use of a very good twelve-foot tube, and with that it was not uneasy to see those, and several other degrees of smaller stars, and some smaller yet, that seemed again to appear and disappear, and these also by giving the same object glass a much bigger aperture, I could plainly and constantly see appear in their former places, so that I have observed some twelve several magnitudes of stars less than those of the six magnitudes commonly recounted in the globes. It has been observed and confirmed by the accuratest observations of the best of our modern astronomers that all the luminous bodies appear above the horizon when they really are below it, so that the sun and moon have both been seen above the horizon, whilst the moon has been in an eclipse. I shall not hear instance in the great refractions that the tops of high mountains seen at a distance have been found to have, all which seem to argue the horizontal refraction much greater than it is hitherto generally believed. I have further taken notice that not only the sun, moon, and stars, and high tops of mountains have suffered these kinds of refraction, but trees and several bright objects on the ground. I have often taken notice of the twinkling of the reflections of the sun from a glass window at a good distance, and of a candle in the night. But that is not so conspicuous, and in observing the setting sun I have often taken notice of the tremulation of the trees and bushes, as well as of the edges of the sun. Divers of these phenomena have been taken notice of by several who have given several reasons of them, but I have not yet met with any altogether satisfactory, though some of their conjectures have been partly true, but partly also false. Setting myself, therefore, upon the inquiry of these phenomena, I first endeavoured to be very diligent in taking notice of the several particulars and circumstances observable in them, and next in making divers particular experiments that might clear some doubts, and serve to determine, confirm, and illustrate the true and adequate cause of each. And upon the whole I find much reason to think that the true cause of all these phenomena is from the inflection or multiplicate refraction of those rays of light within the body of the atmosphere, and that it does not proceed from a refraction caused by any terminating superficies of the air above, nor from any such exactly defined superficies within the body of the atmosphere. This conclusion is grounded upon these two propositions. First, that a medium whose parts are unequally dense and moved by various motions and transpositions as to one another, will produce all those visible effects upon the rays of light, without any other coefficient cause. Secondly, that there is in the air or atmosphere such a variety in the constituent parts of it, both as to their density and rarity, and as to their diverse mutations and positions one to another. By density and rarity I understand a property of a transparent body that does either more or less refract a ray of light coming obliquely upon its superficies out of a third medium toward its perpendicular. As I call glass a more dense body than water and water a more rare body than glass because of the refractions more or less deflecting towards the perpendicular that are made in them of a ray of light out of the air that has the same inclination upon either of their superficies. So as to the business of refraction, spirit of wine is a more dense body than water, it having been found by an accurate instrument that measures the angles of refractions to minutes, that for the same refracted angle of thirty degrees zero minutes, in both these mediums, the angle of incidence in water was but forty-one degrees thirty-five minutes, but the angle of the incidence in the trial with spirit of wine was forty-two degrees forty-five minutes. But as to gravity, water is a more dense body than spirit of wine, for the proportion of the same water to the same very well rectified spirit of wine was as twenty-one to nineteen. So as to refraction water is more dense than ice, for I have found by a most certain experiment which I exhibited before divers illustrious persons of the Royal Society, that the refraction of water was greater than that of ice, though some considerable authors have affirmed the contrary, and though the ice be a very hard, and the water a very fluid body. That the former of the two preceding propositions is true may be manifested by several experiments. At first, if you take any two liquors differing from one another in density, but yet such as will readily mix, as salt water or brine, and fresh, almost any kind of salt dissolved in water and filtrated, so that it be clear, spirit of wine and water, nay, spirit of wine and spirit of wine, one more highly rectified than the other, 
and very many other liquors, if, I say, you take any two of these liquors, and mixing them in a glass vial against one side of which you have fixed, or glued, a small round piece of paper, and shaking them well together, so that the parts of them may be seen somewhat disturbed and move up and down, you endeavor to see that round piece of paper through the body of the liquors, you shall plainly perceive the figure to wave and to be indented much, after the same manner as the limb of the sun through a telescope seems to be, save only that the mutations here are much quicker. And if, instead of this bigger circle, you take a very small spot, and fasten and view it as the former, you will find it to appear much like the twinkling of the stars, though much quicker. Which two phenomena, for I shall take notice of no more at present, though I could instance in multitudes of others, must necessarily be caused by an inflection of the rays within the terminating superficies of the compounded medium, since the surfaces of the transparent body through which the rays pass to the eye are not at all altered or changed. This inflection, if I may so call it, I imagine to be nothing else but a multiplicate refraction, caused by the unequal density of the constituent parts of the medium whereby the motion, action, or progress of the ray of life is hindered from proceeding in a straight line, and inflected or deflected by a curve. Now that it is a curved line is manifest by this experiment. I took a box, such as ADGE, in the first figure of the 37th scheme, whose sides ABCD and EFGH were made of two smooth flat plates of glass. Then filling it half full with a very strong solution of salt, I filled the other half with very fair fresh water, then exposing the opacous side DHGC to the sun, I observe both the refraction and inflection of the sunbeams ID and KH, and marking as exactly as I could the points P, N, O, M, by which the ray KH passed through the compounded medium, I found them to be in a curved line, for the parts of the medium, being continually more dense the nearer they were to the bottom, the ray PF was continually more and more deflected downwards from the straight line. This inflection may be mechanically explained either by M. Descartes principles, by conceiving the globules of the third element to find less and less resistance against that side of them which is downwards, or by a way which I have further explicated in the Inquisition about colors, to be from an obligation of the pulse of light whence the under part is continually promoted and consequently refracted towards the perpendicular, which cuts the orbs at right angles. But the particular figure of the curve line described by this way of light is, I shall not now stand to examine, especially since there may be so many sorts of it, as there may be varieties of the positions of the intermediate degrees of density and rarity, between the bottom and the top of the inflecting medium. I could produce many more examples and experiments to illustrate and prove this first proposition, viz. that there is such a constitution of some bodies as will cause inflection, as not to mention those I have observed in horn, tortoise shell, transparent gums, and rosinous substances, the veins of glass, nay, of melted crystal, found and much complained of by glass grinders and others, might sufficiently demonstrate the truth of it to any diligent observer but that I presume I have by this example given proof sufficient, viz. ocular demonstration, to events that there is such a modulation or bending of the rays of light as I have called inflection, differing from both reflection and refraction, since they are both made in the superficies, this only in the middle, and likewise that this is able or sufficient to produce the effects I have ascribed to it. It remains therefore to show that there is such a property in the air, and that it is sufficient to produce all the above-mentioned phenomena, and therefore may be the principal, if not the only, cause of them. First, that there is such a property may be proved from this, that the parts of the air are some of them more condensed, others more rarefied, either by the differing heat or differing pressure it sustains, or by the somewhat heterogeneous vapors interspersed through it. For as the air is more or less rarefied, so does it more or less refract a ray of light that comes out of a denser medium from the perpendicular. This you may find true if you make a trial of this experiment. Take a small glass bubble made in the form of that in the second figure of the 37th scheme, and by heating the glass very hot and thereby very much rarefying the included air, or which is better, by rarefying a small quantity of water included in it into vapors, which will expel the most part, if not all the air, 
and then sealing up the small neck of it and letting it cool, you may find, if you place it in a convenient instrument, that there will be a manifest difference as to the refraction. As if in this second figure you suppose A to represent a small cider hole through which the eye looks upon an object as C, through the glass bubble B, and the second side L, all which remain exactly fixed in their several places, the object C being so sized and placed, that it may just seem to touch the upper and under edge of the whole L, and so all of it be seen through the small glass ball of rarefied air, then by breaking off the small sealed neck of the bubble, without at all stirring the sight's object or glass, and admitting the external air, you will find yourself unable to see the utmost ends of the object, but the terminating rays A, E, and A, D, which were before refracted to G and F by the rarefied air, will proceed almost directly to I and H, which alteration of the rays, seeing there is no other alteration made in the organ by which the experiment is tried, save only the admission or exclusion of the condensed air, must necessarily be caused by the variation of the medium contained in the glass B. The greatest difficulty in the making of which experiment is from the uneven surfaces of the bubble which will represent an uneven image of the object. Now that there is such a difference of the upper and under parts of the air is clear enough evinced from the late improvement of the Torricellian experiment, which has been tried at the tops and feet of mountains, and may be further illustrated and inquired into by a means which some while since I thought of and used for the finding by what degrees the air passes from such a degree of density to such a degree of rarity, and another for the finding what pressure was requisite to make it pass from such a degree of rarefaction to a determinate density. Which experiments, because they may be useful to illustrate the present inquiry, I shall briefly describe. I took then a small glass pipe AB, about the bigness of a swan's quill, and about four foot long, which was very equally drawn, so that as far as I could perceive, no one part was bigger than another. This tube being open at both ends, I fitted into another small tube DE, that had a small bore just big enough to contain the small pipe, and this was sealed up at one, and opened at the other end about which opened end I fastened a small wooden box C with cement, so that filling the bigger tube and part of the box with quicksilver, I could thrust the smaller tube into it till it were all covered with the quicksilver. Having thus done, I fastened my bigger tube against the side of a wall, that it might stand the steadier, and plunging the small tube clear under the mercury in the box, I stopped the upper end of it very fast with cement. Then lifting up the small tube, I drew it up by a small pulley, and a string that I had fastened to the top of the room, and found the height of the mercurial cylinder to be about twenty-nine inches. Then letting down the tube again, I opened the top and then thrust down the small tube till I perceived the quicksilver to rise within it to a mark that I had placed just an inch from the top, and immediately clapping on a small piece of cement that I had kept warm, I with a hot iron sealed up the top very fast, then letting it cool that both the cement might grow hard and more especially that the air might come to its temper natural for the day I tried the experiment in, I observed diligently and found the included air to be exactly an inch. Here you are to take notice that after the air is sealed up the top of the tube is not to be elevated above the superficies of the quicksilver in the box till the surface of that within the tube be equal to it. For the quicksilver, as I have elsewhere proved, being more heterogeneous to the glass than the air, will not naturally rise up so high within the small pipe as the superficies of the mercury in the box, and therefore you are to observe how much below the outward superficies of the mercury in the box that of the same in the tube does stand, when the top being open, free ingress is admitted to the outward air. Having thus done, I permitted the cylinder or small pipe to rise out of the box till I found the surface of the quicksilver in the pipe to be two inches above that in the box, and found the air to have expanded itself but one sixteenth part of an inch. Then drawing up the small pipe till I found the height of the quicksilver within to be four inches above that without, I observed the air to be expanded only one-seventh of an inch more than it was at first, and to take up the room of one and one-seventh inch. Then I raised the tube till the cylinder was six inches high, and found the air to take up one and two-ninths inches of room in the pipe, and then to eight, ten, 
twelve, etc. The expansion of the air that I found to each of which cylinders are set down in the following table, where the first row signifies the height of the mercurial cylinder, the next the expansion of the air, the third the pressure of the atmosphere, or the highest cylinder of mercury, which was then near thirty inches. The last signifies the force of the air so expanded, which is found by subtracting the first row of numbers out of the third. For having found that the outward air would then keep up the quicksilver to thirty inches, look whatever of that height is wanting must be attributed to the elator of the air depressing. And therefore having the expansion in the second row, and the height of the subjacent cylinder of mercury in the first, and the greatest height of the cylinder of mercury, which of itself counterbalances the whole pressure of the atmosphere by subtracting the numbers of the first row out of the numbers of the third, you will have the measure of the cylinder so depressed, and consequently the force of the air in the several expansions registered. Table. The height of the cylinder of mercury that together with the elator of the included air balance the pressure of the atmosphere. The expansion of the air. The height of the mercury that counterbalance the atmosphere. The strength of the elator of the expanded air. Height of cylinder zero. Expansion of air one. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator thirty. Height of cylinder two. Expansion of air one and one sixteenth. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator twenty eight. Height of cylinder four. Expansion of air one and one seventh. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator twenty six. Height of cylinder six. Expansion of air one and two ninths. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator twenty four. Height of cylinder eight. Expansion of air one and one third. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator twenty two. Height of cylinder ten. Expansion of air one and one half. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator twenty. Height of cylinder twelve. Expansion of air one and two thirds. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator eighteen. Height of cylinder fourteen. Expansion of air one and five sixth. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator sixteen. Height of cylinder sixteen. Expansion of air two and two twenty sevenths. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator fourteen. Height of cylinder eighteen. Expansion of air two and four ninths. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator twelve. Height of cylinder twenty. Expansion of air three. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator ten. Height of cylinder twenty two. Expansion of air three and seven ninths. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator eight. Height of cylinder twenty four. Expansion of air five and seven eighteenths. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator six. Height of cylinder twenty five. Expansion of air six and two thirds. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator five. Height of cylinder twenty six. Expansion of air eight and one half. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator four. Height of cylinder twenty six and one quarter. Expansion of air nine and one half. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator three and three quarters. Height of cylinder twenty six and one half. Expansion of air ten and three quarters. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator three and one half. Height of cylinder twenty six and three quarters. Expansion of air thirteen. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator three and one quarter. Height of cylinder twenty seven. Expansion of air fifteen and one half. Atmospheric pressure thirty. Strength of elator three. End of table. I had several other tables of my observations and calculations which I then made, but it being above a twelve month since I made them, and by that means having forgot many circumstances and particulars, I was resolved to make them over once again, which I did August the second, sixteen sixty one with the very same tube which I used the year before when I first made the experiment, for it being a very good one I had carefully preserved it. And after having tried it over and over again, 
and being not well satisfied of some particulars, I at last having put all things in very good order, and being as attentive and observant as possibly I could, of every circumstance requisite to be taken notice of, did register my several observations in this following table, in the making of which I did not exactly follow the method that I had used at first, but having lately heard of Mr. Townley's hypothesis, I shaped my course in such sort as would be most convenient for the examination of that hypothesis, the event of which you have in the latter part of the last table. The other experiment was to find what degrees of force were requisite to compress or condense the air into such or such a bulk. The manner of proceeding therein was this. I took a tube about five foot long, one of whose ends was sealed up, and bended in the form of a siphon much like that represented in the fourth figure of the thirty-seventh scheme one side whereof a d that was opened at a was about fifty inches long the other side b c shut at b was not much above seven inches long then placing it exactly perpendicular i poured in a little quicksilver and found that the air b c was six and seven eighths inches or very near to seven then pouring in quicksilver at the longer tube i continued filling of it till the air in the shorter part of it was contracted into half the former dimensions and found the height exactly nine and twenty inches, and by making several other trials and several other degrees of condensation of the air, I found them exactly answer the former hypothesis. But having, by reason it was a good while since I first made, forgotten many particulars, and being much unsatisfied in others, I made the experiment over again, and from the several trials collected the former part of the following table where in the row next to the left hand, 24 signifies the dimensions of the air, sustaining only the pressure of the atmosphere, which at that time was equal to a cylinder of mercury of 9 and 20 inches. The next figure above it was the dimensions of the air enduring the first compression made by a cylinder of mercury 5 and 3 sixteenths inches high, to which the pressure of the atmosphere 9 and 20 inches being added, the elastic strength of the air so compressed will be found... 34 and 3 sixteenths, etc. A table of the elastic power of the air, both experimentally and hypothetically calculated according to its various dimensions. The dimensions of the included air. The height of the mercurial cylinder counterpoised by the atmosphere, also known as the atmospheric pressure. The mercurial cylinder added or taken from the former. The summer difference of these two cylinders, what they ought to be, according to the hypothesis. The dimensions of the air, 12. The atmospheric pressure, 29. The cylinder added to the former, 29. The sum of the two cylinders, 58. What they ought to be, 58. The dimensions of the air, 13. The atmospheric pressure, 29. The cylinder added to the former, 24 and 11 sixteenths. The sum of the two cylinders, 53 and 11 sixteenths. What they ought to be, 53 and 7 thirteenths. The dimensions of the air, 14. The atmospheric pressure, 29. The cylinder added to the former, 20 and 3 sixteenths. The sum of the two cylinders, 49 and 3 sixteenths. What they ought to be. 49 and 5 sevenths. The dimensions of the air, 16. The atmospheric pressure, 29. The cylinder added to the former, 14. The sum of the two cylinders, 43. What they ought to be, 43 and a half. The dimensions of the air, 18. The atmospheric pressure, 29. The cylinder added to the former, 9 and 1 eighths. The sum of the two cylinders, 38 and 1 eighth. What they ought to be, 38 and 2 thirds. The dimensions of the air, 20. The atmospheric pressure, 29. The cylinder added to the former, 5 and 3 sixteenths. The sum of the two cylinders, 39 and 3 sixteenths. What they ought to be, 34 and 4 fifths. The dimensions of the air, 24. The atmospheric pressure, 29. The cylinder added to the former, zero. The sum of the two cylinders, 29. What they ought to be, 29. The dimensions of the air, 48. The atmospheric pressure, 29. The cylinder taken from the former, 14 and 5 eighths. 
the difference of the two cylinders fourteen and three eighths, what they ought to be fourteen and a half, the dimensions of the air ninety six, the atmospheric pressure twenty nine, the cylinder taken from the former twenty two and one eighth, the difference of the two cylinders six and seven eighths, what they ought to be seven and two eighths, the dimensions of the air one hundred ninety two, the atmospheric pressure twenty nine, the cylinder taken from the former twenty five and five eighths, the difference of the two cylinders three and three eighths, what they ought to be three and five eighths, the dimensions of the air three hundred eighty four, the atmospheric pressure twenty nine, the cylinder taken from the former twenty seven and two eighths, the difference of the two cylinders one and six eighths, what they ought to be one and seven sixteenths. The dimensions of the air 576, the atmospheric pressure 29, the cylinder taken from the former 27 and 7 eighths, the difference of the two cylinders 1 and 1 eighth, what they ought to be 1 and 5 twenty fourths. The dimensions of the air 768, the atmospheric pressure 29, the cylinder taken from the former 28 and 1 eighth, the difference of the two cylinders 7 eighths what they ought to be seven and one quarter eighths the dimensions of the air nine hundred sixty the atmospheric pressure twenty nine the cylinder taken from the former twenty eight and three eighths the difference of the two cylinders five eighths what they ought to be five and four fifths eighths the dimensions of the air eleven hundred fifty two the atmospheric pressure twenty nine the cylinder taken from the former twenty eight and seven sixteenths, the difference of the two cylinders nine sixteenths, what they ought to be ten sixteenths. End of table. From which experiments, I think, we may safely conclude that the elator of the air is reciprocal to its extension, or at least very near, so that to apply it to our present purpose, which was indeed the chief cause of inventing these ways of trial, we will suppose a cylinder indefinitely extended upwards. I say a cylinder, not a piece of a cone, because, as I may elsewhere show in the explication of gravity, that triplicate proportion of the shells of a sphere to their respective diameters, I suppose to be removed in this case by the decrease of the power of gravity, and the pressure of the air at the bottom of this cylinder to be strong enough to keep up a cylinder of mercury, of thirty inches. Now because by the most accurate trials of the most illustrious and incomparable Mr. Boyle, published in his deservedly famous pneumatic book, the weight of quicksilver to that of the air here below is found near about as fourteen thousand to one. If we suppose that the parts of the cylinder of the atmosphere to be everywhere of an equal density, we shall, as he there deduces, find it extended to the height of thirty-five thousand feet, or seven miles. But because by these experiments we have somewhat confirmed the hypothesis of the reciprocal proportion of the elators to the extensions, we shall find that by supposing this cylinder of the atmosphere divided into a thousand parts, each of which being equivalent to thirty-five feet, or seven geometrical paces, that is, each of these divisions containing as much air as is supposed in a cylinder near the earth, of equal diameter and thirty-five foot high, we shall find the lowermost to press against the surface of the earth, with the whole weight of the above mentioned the thousand parts. The pressure of the bottom of the second against the top of the first to be one thousand minus one equals nine hundred ninety nine, of the third against the second it to be one thousand minus two equals nine hundred ninety eight, of the fourth against the third to be one thousand minus three equals nine hundred ninety seven of the uppermost against the 999, or that next below it, to be 1,000 minus 999 equals 1. So that the extension of the lowermost next the earth will be to the extension of the next below the uppermost, as 1 to 999, for as the pressure sustained by the 999 is to the pressure sustained by the first, so is the extension of the first to the extension of the 999 so that from this hypothetical calculation we shall find the air to be indefinitely extended. For if we suppose the whole thickness of the air to be divided, as I just now instanced, into a thousand parts, and each of these under differing dimensions or altitudes to contain an equal quantity of air, 
we shall find that the first cylinder whose base is supposed to lean on the earth will be found to be extended thirty five and thirty five nine hundred ninety ninths foot the second equal division or cylinder whose basis is supposed to lean on the top of the first shall have its top extended higher by thirty five and seven nine hundred ninety eighths the third thirty five and one hundred five nine hundred ninety sevenths the fourth thirty five and one hundred forty nine hundred ninety sixth and so onward each equal quantity of air having its dimension measured by thirty five and some additional number expressed always in the manner of a fraction whose numerator is always the number of the place multiplied by thirty-five, and whose denominator is always the pressure of the atmosphere sustained by that part, so that by this means we may easily calculate the height of nine hundred ninety-nine divisions, of those one thousand divisions I supposed, whereas the uppermost may extend itself more than as high again, nay, perhaps indefinitely, or beyond the moon. For the elators and expansions being in reciprocal proportions, since we cannot yet find the plus ultra, beyond which the air will not expand itself, we cannot determine the height of the air, for since, as we have shown, the proportion will be always as the pressure sustained by any part is to thirty-five, so one thousand to the expansion of that part, the multiplication or product, therefore, of the pressure and expansion, that is, of the two extreme proportionals, being always equal to the product of the means, or thirty-five thousand, it follows since that rectangle or product may be made up of the multiplication of infinite diversities of numbers that the height of the air is also indefinite for since as far as i have yet been able to try the air seems capable of an indefinite expansion the pressure may be decreased in infinitum and consequently its expansion upwards indefinite also there being therefore such a difference of density and no experiment yet known to prove a saltus or skipping from one degree of rarity to another much differing from it, that is, that an upper part of the air should so much differ from that immediately subjacent to it, as to make a distinct superficies, such as we observe between the air and water, etc., but it being more likely that there is a continual increase of rarity in the parts of the air, the further they are removed from the surface of the earth. It will hence necessarily follow that as in the experiment of the salt and fresh water, the ray of light passing obliquely through the air also which is of very different density will be continually and infinitely inflected or bended from a straight or direct motion this granted the reason of all the above recited phenomena concerning the appearance of the celestial bodies will very easily be deduced as first the redness of the sun moon and stars will be found to be caused by the inflection of the rays within the atmosphere that it is not really in or near the luminous bodies will i suppose be very easily granted seeing that this redness is observable in several places differing in longitude to be at the same time different the setting and rising sun of all parts being for the most part red and secondly that it is not merely the color of the air interposed will i suppose without much more difficulty be yielded seeing that we may observe a very great interstitium of air betwixt the object and the eye makes it appear of a dead blue far enough differing from a red or yellow but thirdly that it proceeds from the refraction or inflection of the rays by the atmosphere this following experiment will i suppose sufficiently manifest take a spherical crystalline vial such as is described in the fifth figure a b c d and having filled it with pure clear water expose it to the sunbeams then taking a piece of very fine venice paper apply it against that side of the globe that is opposite to the sun as against the side b c and you shall perceive a bright red ring to appear caused by the refraction of the rays a a a a which is made by the globe in which experiment if the glass and water be very clear so that there be no sands nor bubbles in the glass nor dirt in the water you shall not perceive any appearance of any other color to apply which experiment we may imagine the atmosphere to be a great transparent globe which being of a substance more dense than the other or which comes to the same that has its parts more dense toward the middle the sunbeams that are tangents or next within the tangents of this globe will be refracted or inflected from their direct passage towards the centre of the globe whence according to the laws of refractions made in a triangular prism and the generation of color set down in the description of muscovy glass 
there must necessarily appear a red color in the transitus, or passage of those tangent rays. To make this more plain, we will suppose in the sixth figure, ABCD, to represent the globe of the atmosphere, EFGH to represent the opacous globe of the earth lying in the midst of it, near to which the parts of the air, sustaining a very great pressure, are thereby very much condensed, from whence those rays that are by inflection made tangents to the globe of the earth, and those without them that pass through the more condensed part of the atmosphere, as supposed between A and E are, by reason of the inequality of the medium, inflected towards the center, whereby there must necessarily be generated a red color, as is more plainly shown in the former cited place. Hence whatsoever opacious bodies, as vapors or the like, shall chance to be elevated into those parts, will reflect a red towards the eye and therefore these evenings and mornings appear reddest that have the most store of vapours and halitutious substances exhaled to a convenient distance from the earth. For thereby the inflection is made the greater, and thereby the colour also the more intense. And several of those exhalations being opacious, reflect several of those rays which through an homogeneous transparent medium would pass unseen. And therefore we see that when there chances to be any cloud situated in those regions, they reflect a strong and vivid red. Now the one great cause of the redness may be this inflection, yet I cannot wholly exclude the colour of the vapours themselves, which may have something of a redness in them, they being partly nitrous and partly fulginous, both which steams tinge the rays that pass through them, as is made evident by looking at the bodies through the fumes of aquafortis, or spirit of nitre, as the newly mentioned illustrious person has demonstrated and also through the smoke of a fire or chimney. End of section 63. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 64 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micrographia by Robert Hook. Section 64. Of a new property in the air, and several other transparent mediums named inflection. Part 2. Having therefore made it probable, at least, that the morning and evening redness may partly proceed from this inflection or refraction of the rays, we shall next show how the oval figure will be likewise easily deduced. Suppose we, therefore, EFGH in the sixth figure of the thirty-seventh scheme, to represent the earth, ABCD the atmosphere, EI and EL two rays coming from the sun, the one from the upper, the other from the nether limb, these rays being by the atmosphere inflected appear to the eye at E, as if they had come from the points N and O, and because the ray L has a greater inclination upon the inequality of the atmosphere than I therefore must it suffer greater inflection, and consequently to be further elevated above its true place, than the ray I, which has a less inclination, will be elevated above its true place, whence it will follow that the lower side appearing nearer the upper than really it is, and the two lateral sides, viz. the right and left side, suffering no sensible alteration from the inflection, at least what it does suffer does rather increase the visible diameter than diminish it, as I shall show by and by, the figure of the luminous body must necessarily appear somewhat elliptical. This will be more plain if, in the seventh figure of the thirty-seventh scheme, we suppose A B to represent the sensible horizon, C D E F the body of the sun really below it, G H I K the same appearing above it, elevated by the inflection of the atmosphere. For if, according to the best observation, we make the visible diameter of the sun to be about three or four and thirty minutes, and the horizontal refraction, according to Tycho, be thereabout, or somewhat more, the lower limb of the sun, E, will be elevated to I. But because by his account the point C will be elevated but twenty-nine minutes, as having not so great an inclination upon the inequality of the air, Therefore IG, which will be the apparent refracted perpendicular diameter of the sun, will be less than CG, which is but twenty-nine minutes, and consequently six or seven minutes shorter than the unreflected apparent diameter. 
the parts d and f will be likewise elevated to h and k whose refraction by reason of its inclination will be bigger than that of the point c though less than that of e therefore will the semi diameter i l be shorter than l g and consequently the underside of the appearing sun more flat than the upper now because the rays from the right and left sides of the sun etc have been observed by ricciola and grimaldus to appear more distant one from another than really they are though by very many observations that i have made for that purpose with a very good telescope fitted with a divided ruler i could never perceive any great alteration yet there being really some it will not be amiss to show that this also proceeds from the refraction or inflection of the atmosphere and this will be manifest if we consider the atmosphere as a transparent globe or at least a transparent shell encompassing an opacous globe which being more dense than the medium encompassing it refracts or inflects all the entering parallel rays into a point or focus so that wheresoever the observer is placed within the atmosphere between the focus and the luminous body the lateral rays must necessarily be more converged towards his eye by the refraction or inflection than they would have been without it and therefore the horizontal diameter of the luminous body must necessarily be augmented this might be more plainly manifest to the eye by the sixth figure but because it would be somewhat tedious and the thing being obvious enough to be imagined by any one that attentively considers it i shall rather omit it and proceed to show that the mass of air near the surface of the earth consists or is made up of parcels which do very much differ from one another in point of density and rarity and consequently the rays of light that pass through them will be variously inflected here one way and there another according as they pass so or so through those differing parts and those parts being always in motion either upwards or downwards or to the right or left or in some way compounded of these they do by this their motion inflect the rays now this way and presently that way this irregular unequal and unconstant inflection of the rays of light is the reason why the limb of the sun moon jupiter saturn mars and venus appear to wave or dance and why the body of the stars appear to tremulate or twinkle their bodies by this means being sometimes magnified and sometimes diminished sometimes elevated other whiles depressed now thrown to the right hand and then to the left and that there is such a property or unequal distribution of parts is manifest from the various degrees of heat and cold that are found in the air from whence will follow a differing density and rarity both as to quantity and refraction and likewise from the vapors that are interposed which by the way i imagine as to refraction or inflection to do the same thing as if they were rarefied air and that those vapors that ascend are both lighter and less dense than the ambient air which buoys them up and that those which descend are heavier and more dense the first of these may be found true if you take a good thick piece of glass and heating it pretty hot in the fire lay it upon such another piece of glass or hang it in the open air by a piece of wire then looking upon some far distant object such as a steeple or tree so as the rays from that object pass directly over the glass before they enter your eye you shall find such a tremulation and wavering of the remote object as will very much offend your eye the like tremulous motion you may observe to be caused by the ascending streams of water and the like now from the first of these it is manifest that from the rarefaction of the parts of the air by heat there is caused a differing refraction and from the ascension of the more rarefied parts of the air which are thrust up by the colder and therefore more condensed and heavy is caused an undulation or wavering of the object for i think that there are very few will grant that glass by as gentle a heat as may be endured by one's hand should send forth any of its parts and steams or vapours which does not seem to be much wasted by that violent fire of the green glass-house but if yet it be doubted let experiment be further made with that body that is accounted by chemists and others the most ponderous and fixed in the world for by heating of a piece of gold and proceeding in the same manner you may find the same effects this trembling and shaking of the rays is more sensibly caused by an actual flame or quick fire or anything else heated glowing hot as by a candle live coal red-hot iron or piece of silver and the like 
The same also appears very conspicuous if you look at an object betwixt which and your eye the rising smoke of some chimney is interposed, which brings into my mind what I had once the opportunity to observe, which was the sun rising to my eye just over a chimney that sent forth a copious steam of smoke. And taking a short telescope which I had then by me, I observed the body of the sun, though it was but just peeped above the horizon, to have its underside not only flatted and pressed inward, as it usually is when near the earth, but to appear more protuberant downwards than if it had suffered no refraction at all. And besides all this, the whole body of the sun appeared to tremble, or dance, and the edges or limb to be very ragged or indented, undulating or waving much in the manner of a flag in the wind. This I have likewise often observed in a hot, sunshiny summer's day, that looking on an object over a hot stone, or dry hot earth, I have found the object to be undulated or shaken much after the same manner. And if you look upon any remote object through a telescope, in a hot summer's day especially, you shall find it likewise to appear tremulous. And further, if there chance to blow any wind, or that the air between you and the object be in a motion or current whereby the parts of it, both rarefied and condensed, are swiftly removed towards the right or left, if then you observe the horizontal ridge of a hill far distant through a very good telescope, you shall find it to wave much like the sea, and those waves will appear to pass the same way with the wind. From which and many other experiments tis clear that the lower region of the air, especially that part of it which lieth nearest to the earth, has for the most part its constituent parcels variously agitated, either by heat or winds, by the first of which, some of them are made more rare, and so suffer a less refraction. Others are interwoven, either with ascending or descending vapours, the former of which, being more light, and so more rarefied, have likewise a less refraction. The latter being more heavy, and consequently more dense, have a greater. Now because that heat and cold are equally diffused every way, and that the further it is spread the weaker it grows, Hence it will follow that the most part of the under-region of the air will be made up of several kinds of lenses, some whereof will have the properties of convex, others of concave glasses, which, that I may the more intelligibly make out, we will suppose in the eighth figure of the thirty-seventh scheme, that A represents an ascending vapour, which, by reason of its being somewhat heterogeneous to the ambient air, is thereby thrust into a kind of globular form, not anywhere terminated but gradually finished, that is, it is most rarefied in the middle about A, somewhat more condensed about BB, more than that about CC, yet further about DD, almost of the same density with the ambient air about EE, and lastly enclosed with the more dense air FF, so that from A to FF there is a continual increase of density. The reason of which will be manifest if we consider the rising vapour to be much warmer than the ambient heavy air. For by the coldness of the ambient air the shell EE -E will be more refrigerated than DD, and that than CC, which will be yet more than BB, and that more than A, so that from F to A there is a continual increase of heat, and consequently of rarity, from whence it will necessarily follow that the rays of light will be inflected or refracted in it, in the same manner as they would be in a concave glass. For the rays GKI, GKI, will be inflected by GKH, GKH, which will easily follow from what I before explained concerning the inflection of the atmosphere. On the other side a descending vapour, or any part of the air included by an ascending vapour, will exhibit the same effects with a convex lens. For if we suppose in the former figure the quite contrary constitution to that last described, that is, the ambient air FF being hotter than any part of that matter within any circle, therefore the coldest part must necessarily be A, as being farthest removed from the heat, all the intermediate spaces will be gradually discriminated by the continual mixture of heat and cold, so that it will be hotter at EE than DD, in DD than CC, in CC than BB, and in BB than A from which a like refraction and condensation will follow, and consequently a lesser or greater refraction, so that every included part will refract more than the including, by which means the rays GKI GKI coming from a star or some remote object 
are so inflected that they will again concur and meet in the point M. By the interposition thereof of this descending vapor, the visible body of the star or other object is very much augmented as by the former it was diminished. From the quick consecutions of these two, one after the other, between the object and your eye, caused by their motion upwards or downwards, proceeding from their levity or gravity, or to the right or left, proceeding from the wind, a star may appear, now bigger, now less, than really it would otherwise without them. And this is that property of a star which is commonly called twinkling or scintillation. The reason why a star will now appear of one color, now of another, which for the most part happens when tis near the horizon, may very easily be deduced from its appearing now in the middle of the vapor, other whiles near the edge. For if you look against the body of a star with a telescope that has a pretty deep convex eyeglass, and so order it that the star may appear sometimes in one place, and sometimes in another of it, you may perceive this or that particular color to be predominant in the apparent figure of the star, according as it is more or less remote from the middle of the lens. This I had here further explained, but that it does more properly belong to another place. I shall therefore only add some few queries, which the consideration of these particulars hinted and so finished this section. And the first I shall propound is, whether there may not be made an artificial transparent body of an exact globular figure, that shall so inflect or refract all the rays, that coming from one point fall upon any hemisphere of it that every one of them may meet on the opposite side and cross one another exactly in a point, and that it may do the like also with all the rays that coming from a lateral point fall upon any other hemisphere. For if so there were to be hoped a perfection of dioptrics, and a transmigration into heaven even whilst we remain here upon earth in the flesh, and a descending or penetrating into the centre and innermost recesses of the earth, and all earthly bodies, Nay, it would open not only a cranny, but a large window, as I may so speak, into the shop of nature, whereby we might be enabled to see both the tools and operators, in the very manner of the operation itself of nature. This, could it be effected, would as far surpass all other kinds of perspectives as the vast extent of heaven does the small point of the earth, which distance it would immediately remove and unite them as twere into one at least that there should appear no more distance between them than the length of the tube into the ends of which these glasses should be inserted. Now whether this may not be effected with parcels of glass of several densities, I have sometimes proceeded so far as to doubt. Though in truth as to the general I have wholly despaired of it, for I have often observed in optical glasses a very great variety of the parts, which are commonly called veins. Nay, some of them round enough, for they are for the most part drawn out into firings, to constitute a type of lens. This I should further proceed to hope, had any one been so inquisitive as to have found out the way of making any transparent body either more dense or more rare, for then it might be possible to compose a globule that should be more dense in the middle of it than in any other part, and to compose the whole bulk, so as that there should be a continual gradual transition from one degree of density to another, such as should be found requisite for the desired inflection of the transmigrating rays. But of this enough at present, because I may say more of it when I set down my own trials concerning the melioration of dioptrics, where I shall enumerate with how many several substances I have made both microscopes and telescopes, and by what and how many ways. Let us as have leisure and opportunity farther consider it. The next query shall be whether by the same collection of a more dense body than the other, or at least of the denser part of the other, there might not be imagined a reason of the apparition of some new fixed stars, as those in the swan, Cassiope's char, Serpentarius, Pisces, Cetus, etc. Thirdly, whether it be possible to define the height of the atmosphere from this inflection of the rays, or from the quicksilver experiment of the rarefication or extension of the air. Fourthly, whether the disparity between the upper and under air be not sometimes so great as to make a reflecting superficies, I have had several observations which seem to have proceeded from some such cause, but it would be too long to relate and examine them. An experiment, also somewhat analogous to this, I have made with salt water and fresh, which two liquors in most positions seem the same, and not to be separated by any determinate superficies which separating surface yet in some other positions did plainly appear. 
and if so, whether the reason of the equal bounding or terminus of the under parts of the clouds may not proceed from this cause, whether, secondly, the reason of the apparition of many suns may not be found out by considering how the rays of the sun may be so reflected as to describe a pretty true image of the body, as we find them from any regular superficies, whether also this may not be found to cause the apparition of some of these paralli, of counterfeit suns, which appear colored by refracting the rays so as to make the body of the sun appear in quite another place than really it is, but of this more elsewhere. 5. Whether the phenomena of the clouds may not be made out by this diversity of density in the upper and under parts of the air, by supposing the air above them to be much lighter than they themselves are, and they themselves to be yet lighter than that which is subjacent to them, many of them seeming to be the same substance with the cobwebs that fly in the air after a fog. Now that such a constitution of the air and clouds, if such there be, may be sufficient to perform this effect, may be confirmed by this experiment. Make as strong a solution of salt as you are able, then filling a glass of some depth half full with it, fill the other half with fresh water, and poise a little glass bubble so that it may sink pretty quick in fresh water, which take and put into the aforesaid glass, and you shall find it to sink till it comes towards the middle, where it will remain fixed without moving either upwards or downwards. And by a second experiment of poising such a bubble in water, whose upper part is warmer, and consequently lighter than the under, which is colder and heavier, the manner of which follows in this next query, which is 6. Whether the rarefication and condensation of water be not made after the same manner, as those effects are produced in the air by heat. For I once poised a sealed up glass bubble so exactly that never so small an addition would make it sink, and as small a detraction make it swim, which suffering to rest in that vessel of water for some time, I always found it about noon to be at the bottom of the water, and at night, and in the morning at the top. Imagining this to proceed from the rarefication of the water caused by the heat, I made trial, and found most true, for I was able at any time either to depress or raise it by heat and cold. For I let the pipe stand for some time in cold water, I could easily raise the bubble from the bottom, whither I had a little afford detruded it by putting the same pipe into warm water. And this way I have been able for a very considerable time to keep a bubble so poised in the water, as that it should remain in the middle and neither sink nor swim. For gently heating the upper part of the pipe with a candle, coal, or hot iron, till I perceived the bubble began to descend, then forbearing, I have observed it to descend to such or such a station, and there to remain suspended for some hours till the heat by degrees were quite vanished, when it would again ascend to its former place. This I have also observed naturally performed by the heat of the air, which being able to rarefy the upper parts of the water sooner than the lower, by reason of its immediate contact, the heat of the air has sometimes so slowly increased that I have observed the bubble to be some hours in passing between the top and bottom. 7. Whether the appearance of the Pike of Tenerife and several other high mountains at so much greater a distance than seems to agree with their respective heights, be not attributed to the curvature of the visual ray that is made by passing obliquely through so differingly dense a medium from the top to the eye very far distant in the horizon. For since we have already, I hope, made it very probable that there is such an inflection of the rays by the differing density of the parts of the air, and since I have found by several experiments made on places comparatively not very high, and have yet found the pressure sustained by those parts of the air at the top and bottom, and also their differing expansions very considerable. And so much that I have found the pressure of the atmosphere lighter at the top of St. Paul's steeple in London, which is about two hundred foot high, than at the bottom by a sixtieth or fiftieth part, and the expansion at the top greater than at the bottom by near about so much also, for the mercurial cylinder at the bottom was about thirty-nine inches and at the top half an inch lower, the air also included in the weather glass that at the bottom filled only one hundred fifty-five spaces, at the top filled 158, though the heat at the top and bottom was found exactly the same with a scaled thermometer. I think it very rational to suppose that the greatest curvature of the rays is made nearest the earth, and that the inflection of the rays above, three or four miles upwards, is very inconsiderable, and therefore that by this means such calculations of the height of mountains as are made from the distance they are visible in the horizon, from the supposal that that ray is a straight line, 
that from the top of the mountain is as twere a tangent to the horizon whence it is seen which really is a curve is very erroneous whence i suppose proceeds the reason of the exceedingly differing opinions and assertions of several authors about the height of several very high hills eight whether this inflection of the air will not very much alter the supposed distances of the planets which seems to have a very great dependence upon the hypothetical refraction or inflection of the air and that refraction upon the hypothetical height and density of the air for since as i hope i have here shown the air to be quite otherwise than has been hitherto supposed by manifesting it to be both of a vast at least an uncertain height and of an unconstant and irregular density it must necessarily follow that its inflection must be varied accordingly and therefore we may hence learn upon what sure grounds all the astronomers hitherto have built who have calculated the distance of the planets from their horizontal parallax for since the refraction and parallax are so nearly allied that the one cannot be known without the other especially by any ways that have been yet attempted how uncertain must the parallax be when the refraction is unknown and how easy is it for astronomers to assign what distance they please to the planets and defend them when they have such a curious subterfuge as that of refraction wherein a very little variation will allow them liberty enough to place the celestial bodies at what distance they please if therefore we would come to any certainty in this point we must go other ways to work and as i have here examined the height and refractive property of the air by other ways than are usual so must we find the parallax of the planets by ways not yet practised and to this end i cannot imagine any better way than the observations of them by two persons at very distant parts of the earth that lie as near as may be under the same meridian or degree of longitude but differing as much in latitude as there can be places conveniently found these two persons at certain appointed times should as near as could be both at the same time observe the way of the moon mars venus jupiter and saturn amongst the fixed stars with a good large telescope and making little economies or pictures of the small fixed stars that appear to each of them to lie in or near the way of the centre of the planet and the exact measure of the apparent diameter from the comparing of such observations together we might certainly know the true distance or parallax of the planet and having any one true parallax of these planets we might very easily have the other by their apparent diameters which the telescope likewise affords us very accurately and thence their motions might be much better known and their theories more exactly regulated and for this purpose i know not any one place more convenient for such an observation to be made in than in the island of st helena upon the coast of africa which lies about sixteen degrees to the southwards of the line and is very near according to the latest geographical maps in the same meridian with london for though they may not perhaps lie exactly in the same yet their observations being ordered accordingly to what i shall anon show it will not be difficult to find the true distance of the planet but were they both under the same meridian it would be much better and because observations may be much easier and more accurately made with good telescopes than with any other instruments it will not i suppose seem impertinent to explain a little what ways i judge most fit and convenient for that particular such therefore as shall be the observatories for this purpose should be furnished with the best telescopes that can be had the longer the better and more exact will their observations be though they are somewhat the more difficultly managed these should be fitted with a reet or divided scale placed at such a distance within the eyeglass that they may be distinctly seen which should be the measures of minutes and seconds by this instrument each observator should at certain prefixed times observe the moon or other planet in or very near the meridian and because it may be very difficult to find two convenient stations that will happen to be just under the same meridian they shall each of them observe the way of the planet both for an hour before and an hour after it arrive at the meridian and by a line or stroke amongst the small fixed stars they shall denote out the way that each of them observe the centre of the planet to be moved in for those two hours these observations each of them shall repeat for many days together that both it may happen that both of them may sometimes make their observations together and that from divers experiments we may be the better assured of what certainty and exactness such kinds of observations are like to prove and because many of the stars which may happen to come within the compass of such an iconism or map may be such as are only visible through a good telescope whose positions perhaps have not been noted nor their longitudes or latitudes anywhere remarked 
therefore each observator should endeavor to insert some fixed star whose longitude and latitude is known or with his telescope he shall find the position of some notable telescopical star inserted in his map to some known fixed star whose place in the zodiac is well defined having by this means found the true distance of the moon and having observed well the apparent diameter of it at the time with a good telescope it is easy enough by one single observation of the apparent diameter of the moon with a good glass to determine her distances in any other part of her orbit or dragon and consequently some few observations will tell us whether she be moved in an ellipsis which by the way may also be found even now though i think we are yet ignorant of her true distance and next which without such observations i think we shall not be sure of we may know exactly the bigness of that ellipsis or circle and her true velocity in each part and thereby be much the better enabled to find out the true cause of all her motions and though even now also we may by such observations in one station as here at london observe the apparent diameter and motion of the moon in her dragon and consequently be enabled to make a better guess at the species or kind of curve in which she is moved that is whether it be spherical or elliptical or neither and with what proportional velocity she is carried in that curve yet till her true parallax be known we cannot determine either next for the true distance of the sun the best way will be by accurate observations made in both these aforementioned stations of some convenient eclipse of the sun many of which may so happen as to be seen by both for the penumbra of the moon may if she be sixty semi diameters distant from the earth and the sun above seven thousand extend to about seventy degrees on the earth and consequently be seen by observators as far distant as london and st helena which are not full sixty nine degrees distant and this would much more accurately than any way that has yet been used determine the parallax and distance of the sun for as for the horizontal parallax i have already shown it sufficiently uncertain nor is the way of finding it by the eclipse of the moon any other than hypothetical and that by the difference of the true and apparent quadrature of the moon is not less uncertain witness their deductions from it who have made use of it for vendeline puts that difference to be but four minutes thirty seconds whence he deduces a vast distance of the sun as i have before shown ricciola makes it a full thirty minutes but reinoldest and kircher no less than three degrees and no wonder for if we examine the theory we shall find it so complicated with uncertainties first from the irregular surface of the moon and from several parallaxes that unless the dichotomy happen in the non of the ecliptic and that in the meridian etc all which happens so very seldom that it is almost impossible to make them otherwise than uncertainly besides we are not yet certain but that there may be somewhat about the moon analogous to the air about the earth which may cause a refraction of the light of the sun and consequently make a great difference in the apparent dichotomy of the moon their way indeed is very rational and ingenious and such as is much to be preferred before the way by the horizontal parallax could all the uncertainties be removed and were the true distances of the moon known but because we find by the experiments of vendeline reynoldus etc that observations of this kind are very uncertain also it were to be wished that such kind of observations made at two very distant stations were promoted and it is so much the more desirable because from what i have now shown of the nature of the air it is evident that the refraction may be very much greater than all the astronomers hitherto have imagined it and consequently that the distance of the moon and other planets may be much less than what they have hitherto made it for first this inflection i have here propounded will allow the shadow of the earth to be much shorter than it can be made by the other hypothesis of refraction and consequently the moon will not suffer an eclipse unless it comes very much nearer the earth than the astronomers hitherto have supposed it secondly there will not in this hypothesis be any other shadow of the earth such as kepler supposes and calls the penumbra which is the shadow of the refracting atmosphere for the bending of the rays being altogether caused by inflection as i have already shown all that part which is ascribed by kepler and others after him to the penumbra or dark part which is without the umbra terrae does clear vanish for in this hypothesis there is no refracting surface of the air and consequently there can be no shadows such as appear in the ninth figure of the thirty-seventh scheme where let a b c d represent the earth and e f g h the atmosphere 
which according to Kepler's supposition is like a sphere of water terminated with an exact surface EFGH. Let the lines MF, LB, ID, KH represent the rays of the sun. Tis manifest that all the rays between LB and ID will be reflected by the surface of the earth, BAD, and consequently the conical space BOD would be dark and obscure. But, say the followers of Kepler, the rays between MF and LB, and between ID and KH, falling on the atmosphere, are refracted both at their ingress and egress out of the atmosphere, nearer towards the axis of the spherical shadow CO, and consequently enlighten a great part of that former dark cone, and shorten and contract its top to N. And because of this reflection of these rays, they say there is superinduced another shell of a dark cone, FPH, whose apex P is yet further distant from the earth. By this penumbra, say they, the moon is eclipsed, for it always passes between the lines 1, 2, and 3, 4. To which I say that if the air be such, as I have newly shown it to be, and consequently cause such an inflection of the rays that fall into it, those dark penumbras FYZQ, HXVT, and ORPS will all vanish. For if we suppose the air indefinitely extended, and to be nowhere bounded with a determinate refracting surface, as I have shown it incapable of having, from the nature of it, it will follow that the moon will nowhere be totally obscured. But when it is below the apex N of the dark blunt cone of the Earth's shadow, now from the supposition that the sun is distant about 7,000 diameters, the point N, according to calculation, being not above 25 terrestrial semi-diameters from the center of the earth, it follows that whensoever the moon eclipsed is totally darkened without affording any kind of light, it must be within 25 semi-diameters of the earth and consequently much lower than any astronomers have hitherto put it. This will seem much more consonant to the rest of the secondary planets, for the highest of Jupiter's moons is between 20 and 30 jovial semi-diameters distant from the center of Jupiter, and the moons of Saturn much about the same number of saturnial semi-diameters from the center of that planet. But these are but conjectures also, and must be determined by such kind of observations as I have newly mentioned. Nor will it be difficult by this hypothesis to salve all the appearance of eclipses of the moon, for in this hypothesis also there will be on each side of the shadow of the earth a penumbra, not caused by the refraction of the air as in the hypothesis of Kepler, but by the faint inlighting of it by the sun. For if in the sixth figure we suppose ESQ and GSR to be the rays that terminate the shadow from either side of the earth, ESQ coming from the upper limb of the sun and GSR from the under, it will follow that the shadow of the earth within those rays, that is the cone GSE, will be totally dark. But the sun being not a point but a large area of light, there will be a secondary dark cone of shadow EPG which will be caused by the earth's hindering part of the rays of the sun from falling on the parts GPR and EPQ, of which have shadow or penumbra that part will appear brightest which lies nearest the terminating rays GP and EP, and those darker that lie nearest to GS and ES. When therefore the moon appears quite dark in the middle of the eclipse, she must be below S, that is, between S and F, when she appears lighter near the middle of the eclipse, she must pass somewhere between RQ and S, and when she is alike light through the whole eclipse, she must pass between RQ and P. End of section 64. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 65 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Observation 59. Of multitudes of small stars discoverable by the telescope. Having in the last observation premised some particulars observable in the medium through which we must look upon celestial objects, I shall here add one observation of the bodies themselves, and for the specimen I have made choice of the Pleiades, or seven stars, commonly so called, 
though in our time and climate there appear no more than six to the naked eye and this i did the rather because the deservedly famous galileo having published a picture of this asterisme was able it seems with his glass to discover no more than thirty-six whereas with a pretty good twelve-foot telescope by which i drew this iconism i could very plainly discover seventy-eight placed in the order they are ranged in the figure and of as many differing magnitudes as the asterisks wherewith they are marked to specify there being no less than fourteen several magnitudes of those stars which are comprised within the drought the biggest whereof is not accounted greater than one of the third magnitude and indeed that account is much too big if it be compared with other stars of the third magnitude especially by the help of a telescope for then by it may be perceived that its splendor to the naked eye may be somewhat augmented by the three little stars immediately above it which are near adjoining it the telescope also discovers a great variety even in the bigness of those commonly reckoned of the first second third fourth fifth and sixth magnitude so that should they be distinguished thereby those six magnitudes would at least afford no less than thrice that number of magnitudes plainly enough distinguishable by their magnitude and brightness so that a good twelve-foot glass would afford us no less than twenty-five several magnitudes nor are these all but a longer glass does yet further both more nicely distinguish the magnitudes of those already noted and also discover several other of smaller magnitudes not discernible by the twelve-foot glass thus have i been able with a good thirty-six-foot glass to discover many more stars in the pleiades than there are here delineated and those of three or four distinct magnitudes less than any of those spots of the fourteenth magnitude and by the twinkling of the diverse other places of this asterisme when the sky was very clear i am apt to think that with longer glasses or such as would bear a bigger aperture there might be discovered multitudes of other small stars yet inconspicuous and indeed for the discovery of small stars the bigger the aperture be the better adapted is the glass for though perhaps it does make the several specks more radiant and glaring yet by that means uniting more rays very near to one point it does make many of those radiant points conspicuous which by putting on a less aperture may be found to vanish and therefore both for the discovery of the fixed star and for the finding of the satellites of jupiter before it be out of the day or twilight i always leave the object glass as clear without any aperture as i can and have thereby been able to discover the satellites a long while before i was able to discern them when the smaller apertures were put on and at other times to see multitudes of other smaller stars which a smaller aperture makes to disappear in that notable asterism also of the second sword of orion where the ingenious monsieur huggins von sulichem has discovered only three little stars in a cluster i have found with a thirty-six foot glass without any aperture the breadth of the glass being about some three inches and a half discovered five and the twinkling of diverse others up and down in diverse parts of that small milky cloud so that tis not likely but that the meliorating of telescopes will afford as great a variety of new discoveries in the heavens as better microscopes would among small terrestrial bodies and both would give us infinite cause more and more to admire the omnipotence of the creator end of section sixty five section sixty six of micrographia this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Observation 60 of the Moon. Having a pretty large corner of the plate for the seven stars, void for filling it up, I have added one small specimen of the appearance of the parts of the moon by describing a small spot of it which though taken notice of both by the excellent hevelius and called mons olympus 
though i think somewhat improperly being rather a veil and represented by figure ten of the thirty-eight scheme and also by the learned Riciolus, who calls it hipparchus and describes it by the figure y yet how far short both of them come to the truth may be somewhat perceived by the draft which i have here added of it in figure z which i drew by a thirty-foot glass in october sixteen sixty four just before the moon was half enlightened but much better by the readers diligently observing it himself at a convenient time with a glass of that length and much better yet with one of the three score foot long for through these it appears a very spacious veil encompassed with a ridge of hills not very high in comparison of many other in the moon nor yet very steep the veil itself a b c d is much of the figure of a pear and from several appearances of it seems to be some very fruitful place that is to have its surface all covered over with some kinds of vegetable substances for in all position of the light on it it seems to give a much fainter reflection than the more barren tops of the encompassing hills and those are much fainter than diverse other cragged chalky or rocky mountains of the moon so that i am not unapt to think that the vale may have vegetables analogous to our grass shrubs and trees and most of these encompassing hills may be covered with so thin a vegetable coat as we may observe the hills with us to be such as the short sheep pasture which covers the hills of salisbury plains up and down in several parts of this place here described as there are multitudes in other places all over the surface of the moon may be perceived several kinds of pits which are shaped almost like a dish some bigger some less some shallower some deeper that is they seem to be a hollow hemisphere encompassed with a round rising bank as if the substance in the middle had been digged up and thrown on either side these seem to me to have been the effects of some motions within the body of the moon analogous to our earthquakes by the eruption of which as it has thrown up a brim a ridge round about higher than the ambient surface of the moon so has it left a hole or depression in the middle proportionably lower diverse places resembling some of these i have observed here in england on the tops of some hills which might have been caused by some earthquake in the younger days of the world but that which does most incline me to this belief is first the generality and diversity of the magnitude of these pits all over the body of the moon next the two experimental ways by which i have made a representation of them the first was with a very soft and well-tempered mixture of tobacco pipe clay and water into which if i let fall any heavy body as a bullet it would throw up the mixture round the place which for a while would make a representation not unlike these of the moon but considering the state and condition of the moon there seems not any probability to imagine that it should proceed from any cause analogous to this for it would be difficult to imagine whence those bodies should come and next how the substance of the moon should be so soft but if a bubble be blown under the surface of it and suffered to rise and break or if a bullet or other body sunk into it be pulled out from it these departing bodies leave an impression on the surface of the mixture exactly like these of the moon save that those also quickly subside and vanish but the second and most notable representation was that i observed in a pot of boiling alabaster for there that powder being by the eruption of vapours reduced to a kind of fluid consistence if whilst it boils it be greatly removed besides the fire the alabaster presently ceasing to boil the whole surface especially that where some of the last bubbles have risen will appear all over covered with small pits exactly shaped like these of the moon and by holding a lighted candle in a large dark room in diverse places to this surface you may exactly represent all the phenomena of these pits in the moon according as they are more or less enlightened by the sun and that there may have been in the moon some such motion as this which may have made these pits will seem the more probable if we suppose it like our earth for the earthquakes here with us seem to proceed from some such cause as the boiling of the pot of alabaster there seeming to be generated in the earth from some subterraneous fires or heat great quantities of vapors that is of expanded aerial substances 
which not presently finding a passage through the ambient parts of the earth do as they are increased by the supplying and generating principles and thereby having not sufficient room to expand themselves extremely condensed at last over power with their elastic properties the resistance of the encompassing earth and lifting it up or cleaving it and so shattering the parts of the earth above it do at length where they find the parts of the earth above them more loose make their way upwards and carrying a great part of the earth before them not only raise a small brim around the place out of which they break but for the most part considerable high hills and mountains and when they break from under the sea diverse times mountainous islands this seems confirmed by the vulcans in several places of the earth the mouths of which for the most part are encompassed with a hill of a considerable height and the tops of those hills or mountains are usually shaped very much like these pits or dishes of the moon instances of these we have in the descriptions of etna in sicily of hecla in iceland of tenerife in the canaries and of several vulcans in new spain described by gage and more especially in the eruption of late years in one of the canary islands in all of which there is not probably only a considerable high hill raised about the mouth of the vulcan but like the spots of the moon the top of those hills are like a dish or basin and indeed if one attentively considers the nature of the thing one may find sufficient reason to judge that it cannot be otherwise for these eruptions whether of fire or smoke always raising great quantities of earth before them must necessarily by the fall of those parts on either side raise very considerable heaps now both from the figures of them and from several other circumstances these pits in the moon seem to have been generated much after the same manner that the holes in alabaster and the vulcans of the earth are made for first it is not improbable but that the substance of the moon may be very much like that of our earth that is may consist of an earthy sandy or rocky substance in several of its superficial parts which parts being agitated undermined or heaved up by eruptions of vapors may naturally be thrown into the same kind of figured holes as the small dust or powder of alabaster next it is not improbable but that there may be generated within the body of the moon diverse such kinds of internal fires and heats as may produce such exhalations for since we can plainly enough discover with a telescope that there are multitudes of such kind of eruptions in the body of the sun itself which is accounted the most noble ethereal body certainly we need not be much scandalized at such kind of alterations or corruptions in the body of this lower and less considerable part of the universe the moon which is only secondary or attendant on the bigger and more considerable body of the earth thirdly tis not unlikely but that supposing such a sandy or mouldering substance to be there found and supposing also a possibility of the generation of the internal elastical body whether you will call it air or vapours tis not unlikely i say but that there is in the moon a principle of gravitation such as in the earth and to make this probable i think we need no better argument than the roundness or globular figure of the body of the moon itself which we may perceive very plainly by the telescope to be bating the small inequality of the hills and vales in it which we are all of them likewise shaped or levelled as it were to answer to the centre of the moon's body perfectly of a spherical's figure that is all the parts of it are so ranged bating the comparatively small ruggedness of the hills and dales that the outmost bounds of them are equally distant from the centre of the moon and consequently it is exceedingly probable also that they are equidistant from the centre of gravitation and indeed the figure of the superficial parts of the moon are so exactly shaped according as they should be supposing it had a gravitating principle as the earth has that even the figure of those parts themselves is of sufficient efficiency to make the gravitation and the other two suppositions probable so that the other suppositions may be rather proved by this considerable circumstance or observation then this supposed explication can by them for he that shall attentively observe with an excellent telescope how all the circumstances notable in the shape of the superficial parts are as it were exactly adapted to suit with such a principle 
will if he well considers the usual method of nature in its other proceedings find abundant argument to believe it to have really there also such a principle for i could never observe among all the mountainous or prominent parts of the moon whereof there is a huge variety that any one part of it was placed in such a manner that if there should be a gravitating or attracting principle in the body of the moon it would make that part to fall or be moved out of its visible posture next the shape and position of the parts is such that they shall all seem put into those very shapes they are in by a gravitating power for first there are but a very few cliffs or very deep declivities in the ascent of these mountains for besides those mountains which are by Hevelius called the Apennine Mountains, and some other which seem to border on the seas of the moon, and those only upon one side, as is common also in those hills that are here on the earth, there are very few that seem to have very steep ascents, but for the most part they are made very round, and much resemble the make of the hills and mountains also of the earth this may be partly perceived by the hills encompassing this vale which i have here described and as on the earth also the middlemost of these hills seems the highest so is it obvious also through a good telescope in those of the moon the vales also in many are much shaped like those of the earth and i am apt to think that could we look upon the earth from the moon with a good telescope we might easily enough perceive its surface to be very much like that of the moon now whereas in this small draught as there would be in multitudes if the whole moon were drawn after this manner there are several little ebullitions or dishes even in the vales themselves and in the encompassing hills also this will from this supposition which i have i think upon very good reason taken be exceedingly easily explicable for as i have several times also observed in the surface of alabaster so ordered as i had before described so many the later eruptions of vapours be even in the middle or on the edges of the former and other succeeding these also in time may be in the middle or edges of these etc of which there are instances enough in diverse parts of the body of the moon and by a boiling pot of alabaster will be sufficiently exemplified to conclude, therefore, it being very probable that the moon has a principle of gravitation, it affords an excellent distinguishing instance in the search after the cause of gravitation or attraction, to hint that it does not depend upon the diurnal or turbinated motion of the earth, as some have somewhat inconsiderately supposed and affirmed it to do. For if the moon has an attractive principle, whereby it is not only shaped round, but does firmly contain and hold all parts united though many of them seem as loose as the sand on the earth and that the moon is not moved about its centre then certainly the turbination cannot be the cause of the attraction of the earth and therefore some other principle must be thought of that will agree with all the secondary as well as primary planets but this i confess is but a probability and not a demonstration which from any observation yet made it seems hardly capable of though how successful future endeavors promoted by the ameliorating of glasses and observing particular circumstances may be in this or any other kind must be with patience expected end of section sixty six end of micrographia by robert hook